Good evening and welcome to the Greenfield Public School School Committee meeting for Wednesday, March 10, 2021. This meeting is being held fully remotely in accordance with the Governor of Massachusetts March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GLC 30A, Section 20. We'll start with a roll call, please, for the members of the school committee, Mem uh, mm -hmm. Secretary Johnson Moussad. Member Karen? Here. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Present. Member Hollins? Here. Secretary Johnson Moussad, I am here. Chair Priority? Here. Member Wall? Here. Mayor Wiedergardner? Here. We are all here. Thank you. So we'll call to order at 6.01 p.m. And the first item of business would be approving, I believe there's two sets of minutes that require our approval this evening. We've got minutes from the uh, regular meeting, February 10, and then uh, from the special meeting on March 1. I'd like to, if possible, just um, take a motion to approve both of those together. Do I have a motion? So move. Member Wall in a second. Second, Johnson Musad. Thank you. And any discussion? Mayor. Mayor Rita Gartner, please go ahead. I, I I have no problem with the motion as written. I just or as stated. I just need to let you know that because I was not in attendance on March first, I will have to probably just abstain. Okay. I was in attendance on February tenth. Okay. Yes. That is so the noted. reason for an abstention. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote to approve the minutes, please. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Moussad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Rita Gardner? Abstain. Motion carries with six yes and one abstain. Great, thank you all. So we'll do public comment now. The way that we work it at our school committee meetings is um, in two sections. The first will be anyone who's able to indicate in the chat of the WebEx that they're interested in a public comment. We'll take those first uh, in the order there they appear. And you'll have three minutes uh, to give your comment after you've stated your name and the town you live in. And once we're done with those, if there's anyone who wants to make a comment uh, that needs to identify themselves by phone, uh, we'll do those in a second group. Do we have anyone who's indicated public comment at this time? Not at this time. Anyone who wants to indicate by phone that they'd like to make a public comment, you could do so now. Anyone at all? Uh, I see Doug Selwyn. Okay, uh, Mr. Selwyn, we're ready for you. Can, you have three minutes. Please state your name and your uh, town you live in, and then you go ahead with your comment. Thanks, Doug Selwyn, Greenfield. Um, I my comment has to do with the um, mandate coming out of Boston that schools will be open for in-person learning starting April 5th for the elementaries and later in the month for middle school. Um, I have a lot of concern about that. Uh, when we walked through the schools in the summer, taking a look at what needed to be done to make them safe, it was clear that an enormous amount of work has to happen to make those schools safe. We are walking through the middle school, but I heard similar stories about the elementaries. Um, and that work hasn't been done. Um, the teachers are not going to be, uh, can't be adequately uh, vaccinated in time for the April 5th um, opening. And so this mandate coming from uh, the education commissioner is really based on getting the kids back in school in time so that they can take the MCAS. And the fact that the MCAS is what it is and that they're not gonna count it this year and that it's gonna be worthless as assessment is not a good enough reason to put the, the lives of our and health of our, our children and teachers at risk. So um, I'm wondering and hoping 
that those in charge of making decisions about whether this happens in Greenfield or not are putting the kids and the teachers first and saying, we are not going to open the schools no matter what Boston says, um, unless we are, we can guarantee as well as anybody can guarantee uh, that the work that's been done in the schools is adequate to support the safety of all concerned. But looking at the fact that kids don't fit in the classrooms, not full classes, the fact that the bathrooms are nowhere near adequate for for buildings that have hundreds of people in them, um, that the air the air vent systems have not been um, modified to the extent they need to, just leaves me really concerned. So I hope that 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 concern is at the top of the list rather than simply following orders. Thanks. We have Melissa in the chat. Okay, thank you, Mr. Selwyn, for your comments. Melissa, you can go ahead. State Hi, your full I'm name and your town you live in, and then you have three minutes. Go ahead. Melissa Webb, I live in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Um, I just wanted to come on and say that I noticed the redrawing of the district lines is on the agenda. And I wanted to say how I really enjoyed being part of the process so far for open discussion with um, the people on that committee. And I know it's a long road ahead and I hope it's one I will be able to be a part of. And um, I really don't feel it's just a simple solution. I feel like it's gonna take a lot of different people and a lot of different options to really move forward. And I hope the committee as a whole can also see that and see that we need some big changes to occur within our school district as well. Thank you for your comment, Melissa. We appreciate it. Any other in the chat? Brittany Secretary C. Johnson, Melissa. Okay. Brittany C., you state your full name, town you live in, and you have three minutes. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Brittany Cooley. I live in Greenfield, and I have a daughter who is a kindergarten student at Four Corners School. Um, I had written a letter to read at this meeting, and I've thought a lot about it over the past 24 hours, but it feels a little inadequate um, to read. So I'm just going to kind of spew off some thoughts that have been swirling in my mind. Um, us parents, you know, were asked to do a uh, fill out a survey um, by today and filled it out, but I feel like uh, thought a lot about it over the Asking past hours, but it our inadequate opinion about whether we would send our children back or not. Uh, I feel like we just don't have the information to make that decision at this point. We don't know what models um, are being offered, what they're going to look like. Um, and now the commissioner has decided yesterday that he wants everyone to go back on April 5th. So I echo a lot of the concerns that Doug um, just um, said. So what I'm hoping for is, um, especially for kindergarten students who've never set foot in a school before, um, I hope that Greenfield would consider applying for a waiver um, for a hybrid option, at least to be offered for early elementary, um, especially those kindergartners. Um, I just feel like going from fully remote to um, fully in person would be just jumping in the deep end. And I hope that you guys will do everything in your power to keep in mind the unique developmental needs of our earliest learners in the district um, and hand them some floaties before asking them to go swim in the deep end. So thank you for your time and for the airtime. Thank you for your comments. We have anyone else in the chat? Secretary Johnson Musa? Not at this time. Okay, uh, we can move on to anyone who needs to identify by phone that they'd like to make a comment. Don't be shy, just unmute and let us know. Not hearing any going once. I don't see anyone who's unmuted. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Uh, after public comment, we have committee reports. Uh, I just want to, um, I'm just gonna say one thing. Um, it's not really a full report. I wanna just acknowledge we've gotten some uh, feedback from people who are expecting that uh, the school committee will begin in-person meetings because we're sending students back to school. And um, I want folks who are concerned about that to, under to know that it, 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 the discussions are in process. 
but that is not something that is as easily done as it is said. Um, and uh, there are a number of logistical pieces, most notably the public health concerns of what it means to have in-person meetings when the public needs to have um, a significant amount of access to the meeting. Um, and we are working with GCTV on um, some of the details and we are looking for spaces. If you don't know this already, the John Zahn Center where we previously met in person, not only is probably way too small to serve the purpose, but also um, it is great, great, currently being used for the vaccine, vaccine clinic in uh, Greenfield. So uh, it, we are having those discussions, but it's not as simple as we all would like it to be to just begin meeting in person again. Uh, so that is my report and we can move on actually um, to the superintendent's report from Dr. Hool. And I think, I don't wanna speak for you, but are you gonna just wrap that into um, your updates on in-person instruction, Dr. Hool? Um, yes, if that uh, if that's possible, Madam Chair. It just seems um, you do. If you want to make a report, <laughs> you're welcome Fine. to make a report if you'd like to. Um, my report is that I'm running as fast as I can right now. So, <laughs> um, my work days are 10 to 12 hours a piece, and uh, sometimes on weekends and all of that kind of stuff. Yes. And we're just moving quickly, so I'll save the rest of it for later. Okay, we appreciate it and all of the effort you put in in the you know, blink of an eye that you've been with us. So thank you and I look forward to, as everyone else I'm sure does, hearing the details later on what you've been working on. Um, we probably have subcommittee reports. Should I'll we do the... student reports? Oh yes, absolutely. We should do uh, student reports. I don't know if um, Principal Patnode is on the line, if she is and wants to do any sort of introduction. Otherwise we can, is it Danny and Shane? Again, we can have them do their student report or principal Pat node, do whatever you'd like. Are they here? I see Shane. Hey, Shane. Hello. Do you have a report for us? Uh, yes, it's uh, me today and my brother Tristan as well. Danny uh, was not able to make it today. Awesome, go ahead. Um, so first off, we have Student Council. Uh, student Council has been working on planning the Polar Plunge and has been working on making it a school-wide event for the first time. And after a survey from the school population, we've decided on a costume to go along with the Polar Plunge. A uh, video will be going out to the students about how to make the costume and when to be plunging. Uh, the Student Council has also been working uh, all year on the Class Cup competition and the pieces to build the Class Cup just came in. Uh, so we're going to start construction on that shortly, and that trophy will go to the winning grade, which at the moment is the juniors. Um, Key, Key Club is doing a Say Something Week in, uh, cooper in cooperation with Sandy Hook Promise to make every student feel welcome, appreciated, and accepted during these isolated times. Key Club is also holding a food drive on March 26th from 5 to 7 p.m. The first edition by the new GHS TV class is currently available online. Check out the GHS website to read all of the great articles. As one of GHS's favorite events, we weren't going to let the pandemic stop us from celebrating. So instead of one night celebration, we celebrate each morning with a morning greeting video of a student or staff member who speaks another language. Then weekly, we are celebrating everything from food to song to dance to fashion. Then on Wednesday, March 31st, we will compile all of our month-long celebrations into a video celebration for our Taste of World Cultures Night. Winter sports just completed their seasons. Boys basketball had a competitive season and their three to five record doesn't accurately represent the hard fought efforts as some of those uh, losses were nail biters. Girls basketball went undefeated and finished with an eight to zero record and senior Katie Hazelton was recognized as a high scorer in all of Franklin County. Green mm -hmm. Wave hockey could not be stopped this year and for the first time in 76 years, went undefeated mm -hmm. with a 10 to zero to one record. Even though the seasons for basketball and hockey were unlike any other, our athletes were excited to participate and compete. GHS fall two seasons currently underway and football, cheer, boys and girls soccer and volleyball are all practicing and getting ready for their seasons. 
Virtual Best Buddies has been visiting special ed classes almost every Friday to join in on their morning activities and meeting, and sometimes participate in dance parties. It's been really nice to get to see them and talk to them all. They always have such positive and kind attitudes. Is done? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Highlight of the meeting, always. Way to go, Greenfield Athletics. That's terrific. Thank you, guys. Okay. Looks like the mayor has a question. Oh, please, Mayor Wiedegartner, you're on mute. All righty. Um, I wonder if I could have a few more details on your food drive. Um, anything that you do, I just want to make both of you students know that you feel is of significance to the whole community and that you could benefit from the whole community knowing about our com communications director, Keith Barnacle, would like to know about it. So the food drive sounds like one of those events. So if you would mind, not mind giving, if you have them at this point, uh, the details on the food drive, I, I would be happy to have them shared community wide. Unfortunately, we don't have those details. Those are part of Key Club and neither of us are on the Key Club, but I could try to um, get some of that information and reach out to you if that would work. Sure, you can certainly call the office at any point, 413-772-1560, or if you want to email mayor at uh, City of Greenfield, then, then with those details, we'll, we'll be happy to try to accommodate you. I got an, a quick message that uh, Principal Patnode can send the flyer to your office. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to have that uh, cross-pollination of the events. We like that. Uh, okay, so other uh, subcommittee reports. Don't be shy. Speak up if you got them. I've lost track this week. Member Hollins, do you have a subcommittee report, please? Well, I sit on planning and construction for the school committee. We met yesterday. It was a very interesting meeting. There's a couple of topics that came up that are uh, of interest to the school committee. One is there's the project that's going to take apart uh, Sanderson Street Road, which runs along the middle school. There was a long discussion about this, and the it's about um, uh, was projected to be about a million and a half dollar project, mostly not to redesign the road, but to go underneath the road and address the city's infrastructure, which needs to be updated. But part of that discussion was the um, history of traffic jams, issues the school had, could there be bike lanes? No, that's not wide enough. And the timeline, the project isn't completely um, mapped out yet, uh, but it will be in uh, Marlo, uh, who's working on it's trying to make sure there's the least um, interruption of school affairs. So that's something interesting. And the second interesting discussion was the role of the Planning and Construction Committee for the city. Um, and it, I know that the school committee has been interested in this, and we have taken some votes that capital borrowing issues over 25,000 that involve buildings need to come to the school committee before they go to the city. But what's getting clearer is the role of the Planning and Construction Committee, which has specialists from city planning and city energy development, school department, you know, zoning, and it's just all different, the knitting of together of a lot of different types of city planning issues. And the uh, um, of the Planning and Construction Committee, not exactly information on how all these different interests intersect with each other and advise the mayor. So what came out of that was the importance of all the city departments. I think the mayor will eventually be communicating this, so I'm just saying, um, that when something is first known, like a roof needs to be placed or doors need to be placed or there's an addition or driveway or whatever, when it first is known, it should really come forward and to be uh, reviewed so that planning and construction actually has an advisory role to the capital budgeting committee when it meets. So it goes in and says what the 
it's because of the project project and the need for money. So if the school department issues have never been discussed there, the school department's at a disadvantage not having a good recommendation from this committee on funding. Somewhere in our uh, review of the timeline for discussing capital needs uh, and approving them and how you work in um, planning and construction committee review is something for us to think about sometime. I think the mayor's office will probably give some guidance to all the different divisions, but um, from what I understand, our school department's kind of been weak in this area, uh, not having a lot of detail for projects that we want completed. So this is um, an important part. We have a lot of buildings, a lot of capital needs, so it's important to kind of uh, keep an eye on when these things come to us and when they go to the planning and construction so that when we need funding, all the information's there with the positive recommendation. That's it for me. Thank you, Member Hollins. Uh, is there any question or comment around that? Okay, other subcommittee reports. I have two. Please, Secretary Johnson Musad, go ahead. Uh, the Racial Justice Advisory Committee met and we're continuing to work on our evening forum plans. Um, and we, uh, we spent some time reviewing that and um, bringing uh, Superintendent Hull up to date on what we've been working on. So, um, but we continue to welcome folks' comments. You can email us at racialjustice at uh, gpsk12.org. Um, so that's it for Racial Justice Advisory Committee. Uh, the policy committee met and we had two items uh, on, uh, related to policy we wanted to address. One of them will be discussed later tonight. It has, has to do with um, the, the policy on what people can use as their icons on their on their Zooms uh, or their, their Google Classroom uh, logos, I guess. So we'll get into that more later tonight. The other item we'll, we'll discuss at a future meeting, but um, essentially it was about the um, emergency cancellation policy and just updating that to, um, to say that the superintendent would come to the school committee if they wanted to have an emergency closing that lasted more than three days. Um, so we that that policy will come up to the school committee another night. That's it. Thank you, Member Johnson. We said uh, questions or comments. I guess questions or comments may be limited to the Racial Justice Advisory Committee because we are going to talk about the other one when we get to that agenda item. Not hearing any. So any other subcommittees that have reports tonight? Ooh, we are breezing through. <laughs> All right. Um, we are on to uh, the, what I like to call the meat of the agenda. The search committee is our first item. Uh, and Member Wall, as hopefully everyone has heard by now, is, is going to lead our search committee process for a new um, superintendent. And there's a few items that we need to discuss and perhaps at least one vote tonight. And uh, Member Wall, if you would be so kind as to give us an overview of what we're going to talk about. I will be happy to do that. Thank you. I have sent to the entire school committee uh, a package of stuff for your review. We need to have a special meeting to talk about this school superintendent search and to figure out uh, how we want to handle it. Among the things that please think about before the, the special school committee meeting are the format of the brochures that you would like to have. And there are many choices in your package of stuff. The, key criteria that you want us to look for in a superintendent, such as qualifications, experience, et cetera. And then we have to figure out how we want to sell the city of Greenfield to those prospective superintendents and what sets us apart and what makes Greenfield a place that uh, a superintendent would like to move. 
We also need to discuss the timeline for uh, getting this work done. There will be virtual focus groups for the community and an online survey that will be conducted and we need to talk about that. There will be a decision made on whether or not to look at all resumes from all people who uh, would like to come to Greenfield or whether we'd like to have some of them screened by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. And we need to also set a deadline for the filing applications. Um, the, the meetings of the people who will be on the search committee will then follow after we've gotten the whole parameters of what we want them to do set up. And I would like to uh, propose uh, a group of people to be on that superintendent search committee and, and to tell you that there are 16 people and they were chosen on the basis of their letters of interest. And we have a variety of people that include teachers, principals, staff, parents, senior citizens, community leaders, special education interests, union representatives, and someone from the city council. So I would propose that the school committee approve the list of the superintendent search committee. And I will read that list now. And if I mispronounce someone's name, I'm really sorry. Uh, but we'll all Jean, to know each other. Member Wall, let's um, yes. let's see, uh, Glenn. I'm I'm uh, putting you on the spot here. I just mm -hmm. made you a presenter, and do you have that list? Did we send it out to everybody? I think we did. Mm -hmm. You're on mute. I do have it, and I will share my screen. Perfect, and then we can um, we can go from there. Thank you. Thank you. So that is the proposed list that I would like to have uh, a motion to accept. I mean, I make a motion to accept this list of prospective uh, people for the search committee. Second. Amy, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I could not see that part of my screen because it's being shared. Um, so we have a motion from Member Wall to accept the list as presented. And do I have a second? I thought I heard one. Mayor Wiedegartner, I see your hand. Okay. Uh, and some discussion. I'll start. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the effort that's gone in from people who put in letters of intent and um, from Member Wall and Member Karen, who um, had most of the discussion around um, selecting this list is, is really commendable. Um, I, I see uh, names that I know and always impressive in Greenfield, names that I don't know. Um, and I think that uh, it also has a nice representation of um, everyone who might want, might, it is a stakeholder in the community around this. So um, uh, I will absolutely vote to uh, endorse this, uh, approve this list. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Question, Hollins? Member Hollins, go ahead. Um, do you happen to know, Jean, of the, for parents on the committee, what I don't need to, I'm not asking for a specific parent, what ages or what school levels the parents represent? Are they all elementary or all high school or is there some mix, if you know? I, I did my best to make a diversity of parents from schools. Of course, we couldn't have one from each school because already, as you can see, the the committee number is very large. Was there someone representing the high school, a student in the high school? Yes, oh, okay. It's, yes, there he is. Okay, thank you. Other questions or discussion? We want to move to a vote on this. A roll call vote, please, Member Johnson Musa. Sure. Member Karen? Yes. 
Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Uh, Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner? Yes. Motion carries. Terrific. Thank you for that work. And thank you to all of those folks who send in letters of interest. Um, I think it had to be whittled down by uh, at least half of who yes. submitted um, <laughs> letters. And then the other piece, I don't want it to get lost here, is that um, we have some kind of setup items that need to happen related to the search committee. And we need to have a, a public um, special school committee meeting to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I can um, actually do tomorrow is have um, Lauren Rice, the, sec the administrative assistant to the superintendent, do a, a quorum, a, a poll for quorum, um, and we can try to get that scheduled next week. Wednesday next week would obviously be city council, so that would be out, but we can look at other times next week. And we did, uh, in full transparency, I always look for times when we can have these meetings during the day, but we want to be transparent and we want to be inclusive and we know that these meetings are going to have to happen in the evening and that is our plan is to have it when we can get as much participation from the community as possible. Um, and the other thing that I thought of uh, member wall and maybe either uh, the folks from TMS or um, the folks from MASC can assist us, we might want to dedicate a section of our website to the superintendent search to be able to put up the, you know, the brochure examples and some of the, you know, an agenda for meetings so people can kind of keep in track, keep track of what's happening, some sort of wiki or, you know, something like that. Um, and I'm guessing that Justin can probably help us with that from TMS. And I'm sure Liz uh, LaFond that you've had experience with assisting with that so we could hopefully talk and get something in motion so people don't feel like they're in the dark. Absolutely. They, uh, great, great. And I want to recognize Liz LaFon from our representative from MASC is here with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. We are looking forward to working with you all on this. This is an exciting time for mm -hmm. Greenfield. Um, and work we will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and then one other thing I did bring up, um, this is a large committee. And um, I would really have liked it it's simply for manageability if it were a smaller number, uh, closer to 11 or 13. Um, and I understand that there's a great deal of interest and there are certainly areas we need to represent. Um, and so I did talk with Member Wall about um, actually making two of the folks or a number of, a small number of the folks be what we would call alternates. Um, and we decided that the first time this, that, that uh, search committee meets, that they would have that discussion and make that decision. Alternates meeting, they wouldn't be voting members unless something happened to a voting member and then they would step in similar to like a jury, um, just to make it more manageable. Uh, but that we will, uh, we will have the actual search committee make that decision is what we decided. Mayor Wiedergartner, a question? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I appreciate greatly the memo that um, Dean Wall put out. It was very helpful and very informative. As a veteran <laughs> of at least one superintendent search and a member of the search committee for the previous superintendent, um, so I'm, I'm really going to speak uh, primarily as a former school committee member I, I took note of the fact that the focus groups, which were very important for parents, are noted here. But if, if memory serves me correctly, and I know that, that we have been given the opportunity through Member Wall to, um, as school committee members, to comment on what we'd like to see in a superintendent, and I appreciate that. But I'm wondering, my recollection of um, a former uh, search committee, which was a few year, quite a few years ago, but still done under the auspices of MASC, school committee members were also individually part of focus group 
conversations so as not to violate the open meeting law. So it wasn't, you know, it was one person at a time. And I'm, I'm noting the absence of that. And I, I feel like it might be very important um, to uh, MASC to hear from each school committee member who has had to be a member of the committee in the recent past and why we might be looking for it and what we might be looking for in a superintendent. And is that not any longer a position of the MASC in these searches or was it just simply overlooked? Um, I didn't, if I may, Amy. <laughs> So I did not overlook it, um, and I would say that I'd be happy to have an individual conversation um, with each and every one of you um, or whomever would like to have that conversation with me. Uh, the reason I didn't, um, I mean, if we have, we obviously can't have a focus group of school committee, right? We're going to do a lot of that sort of talking about what you want and what you need in a superintendent at mm -hmm. the special meeting. And right. then probably subsequent to that when the draft brochure comes back, right? They'll be polishing it up um, after you all give more thought to those things. Um, I would not typically suggest that a member of the school committee attend a focus group um, because it can sometimes have the effect of um, causing people not to speak freely. Like if I have a group of parents, for example, or if I have a group of administrators or teachers, um, it, it might cause to just cut that conversation and the, the honest feedback down. Um, so I think if what you're getting at is, do you want me to speak to everybody individually to, to get that feedback? I'm more than happy to do that. Yes, that is, I, I have no intentions of wanting to be part of a focus group of parents or okay. anyone else, nor do I think any school committee member should be. I do right. think it's important because we actually ultimately at the end of the day have to work on a daily basis with that superintendent. And it is important that you hear from us. Absolutely. What we, what we as individuals are looking for as individual school committee. Uh, so Jean and I, I'm sorry, Jean and I have had several conversations and I guess I just want to really be clear, whatever it is you all want to do in this search is exactly what we're going to do. Um, this is your search and the best job I can do is make you all happy and comfortable with the transparency and the openness and the inclusiveness of the search um, so that you find somebody who truly fits Greenfield and is going to be a good fit and is going to stay in Greenfield and is going to make you all happy. So you tell me you want to do it, and we're going to do it. Thank you. Awesome. Sure. Thank you, Liz. Any further uh, questions or discussion at this point on the search committee for the new superintendent? OK, I'm not hearing anything. So uh, Liz LaFon from MASC, I thank you very much for joining us tonight. Of course. And um, I'm sure we'll be seeing your face quite a bit from now on, so thank you. And Member Wall uh, and also Member Karen, thank you very much for all the work you've put into um, getting us to this point. And um, we'll just keep moving forward as the mayor would say we go onward, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to the donation acceptance from Dean Spean. So in the materials for this evening, Right after the minutes and the budget stuff. Let me see what page it is. So if people are following along, I have it as page 29. Uh, we received a um, very thoughtful and generous donation uh, to the school feeding program from Dean's Beans Organic Co Coffee, which is um, a local coffee place in orange. Um, I don't remember what the amount of the donation was, and it doesn't look like it says in the letter. Dr. Hool, do you know what the amount of the donation was? I believe it's $500. Wow. Terrific. Um, so they've been huge supporters. I, if I'm keeping track correctly, this is um, their second 
donation to us since the pandemic, since the shutdown, and since we um, started the the uh, extended summer feeding program, which has now gone on for almost a year. Um, and so we do need to uh, vote to accept the donation from Dean's Beans. Can I get a motion to that effect? Don't all speak at once, guys. So moved. We want to take the money. Uh, was that <laughs> Member Ekstrom? Yep. Yes. And a second. Second from Jean Wall, from Member Wall. Do we have any discussion about this? <laughs> Let's do a Thank roll you, call Dean's vote, Beans. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dean's Beans. All right. Roll call. Member Karen. Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom. Yes. Member Hollins. Yes. Secretary Johnson, we saw it. I'm a yes. Chair Proietti. Yes. Member Wall. Yes. Mayor Weedy Gardner. Yes. Surprise, awesome. surprise. We unanimously <laughs> accepted money. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dean Spines. Uh, we are grateful, of course. Okay, we are into item seven on the agenda, the policy reading uh, from the policy subcommittee. There are actually uh, two here, but I think we're only gonna do one at this time. We're gonna work through the acceptable use policy. Um, I actually believe that this did not make it into the materials for tonight, um, but it is. Uh, it has been distributed to the school committee members and we likely can share, again, I'm putting you on the spot, Secretary Johnson Musad, to actually share the document. I can quickly email it to you if you need it. I think I got it. Okay, great. To say I have it on screen, Madam Chair, if that helps. <laughs> oh. oh, we got it, okay. Um, so, uh, Member, Secretary Johnson, said, can you walk us through the changes here? They're pretty simple once you get them outlined. I can't. I would defer to the, the superintendent to, on that. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Is it possible to increase the print? Yeah, I'm working on it. Nice. Um, Secretary Johnson, Musad, if I can uh, beg your indulgence to put up the actual policy itself, this is yeah. about that. <laughs> That's not what oh, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to stop the share. And let's see, you need, do you have power to do that or does the it chair? Like I, it looks like I do. Who knew? Oh, great. So. Hope everybody can see what I'm looking at here. Mm -hmm. Um, And let me just see if I can. The size of this Google Docs using Word, so everything is always a little bit of a challenge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Control plus. There we go. All <laughs> right. So um, the um, former policy that you have is the same number as this one, and, and the lettering system comes from the National Boards of uh, National School Boards Association. How they came to these uh, lettering systems is beyond me, but. Be that as it may, the former policy that you have in um, your policy manual is called acceptable use. Uh, over the past few years, uh, MESC, uh, through their master policy manual, has changed this to empower digital use policy. It is fairly um, similar to the one that you have. It is a little um, more concise, the policy itself. Um, so it's just kind of expressing availability around um, digital um, ideas, et cetera. This regulation is really where we need to focus. And this was um, taken from your current regulation and some things stricken from it and uh, other text um, put in. So um, has a section on responsibilities and I'm sure you had a a chance, I know this was riveting reading, <laughs> so on and so forth, um, and it has lost a bit of formatting in the translation here. So, mm -hmm. but um, here to um, some extra stuff here. I apologize. Let me see if I can. Anyway, we're we 
thinking to um, try and do this was, um, hmm, this does not look like it is the right version of it either. There's two documents that I have. Right. Um, so let me just think if I can talk you through this without uh, looking at this because for some reason I've got got like three device, uh, three technology devices open here, and uh, obviously I'm in a bit of a quandary here. So um, rather than confuse the issue, um, basically um, the additions to the policy have to do with students and what they present on screen um, as a visual. And um, this came to the policy subcommittee by way of um, Principal Patnode, um, who said that um, following the June 6th um, riot on the Capitol, that um, students were doing things like using Confederate flags as their avatars in the Google Classroom, et cetera. Um, so we want to obviously make sure that our environment is as welcoming as possible. So what um, the additions to the policy do is say that the district is going to enact in both its digital classroom and I didn't use Google Classroom on purpose because um, the vendor changes, then we have to change the policy to meet the vendor. So if you say a digital classroom, then it doesn't really matter what platform it is, um, but that the district would use um, the student's initials and would disable the ability for students to have their own avatars um, so that uh, everybody feels safe and feels um, you know, welcomed into the digital classroom environment. So those were the big things that were the big um, changes in this. So, um, you know, and I did add some language to indicate not only is it just using um, the internet because the policy kind of assumes that you're in person, but it also says accessing the network in terms of you know, things that could be construed as hate speech or harassment. Um, and the reason why is because even if a student is at home on a district device, they are accessing the district network when they go in with their username and password. So that's a more broadly defined definition than just using the internet, quote unquote. So um, that's uh, why that would be uh, in that way. So I don't know. Anybody has any questions? If the committee were to so choose, um, we're feeling like time is of the essence of this, that the committee could vote to waive the, the first and second reading procedure and just move forward to adopt it. Okay, so let's um, comment. Hang on, let's do a motion first. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think how to uh, approach this. So I think the first thing we would do is a motion to um, waive the second reading. And obviously there is a comment period after we do that motion um, before we would move forward with uh, discussion about the actual contents of the document, the policy change. Does that make sense? Yes, the mayor is saying yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so can I get a motion to waive the second reading and move to uh, approve this this evening? So moved. From the mayor. And a second. Member Holland, you have the microphone off. You want to be the second? You're, you're the only one who's not muted. Uh, I'll second to okay. waive the second reading. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And let's discuss. My question is, do we have what we need to 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 move forward with this. Um, have people had a chance to look it over and do they feel comfortable with, with moving forward? Mayor Weta Gartner and then Member Holland. I have had a chance to look it over um, and I, I only have one question. I have two documents in front of me with that bizarre file name. One is IJNDB empowered digital use policy. It's a much shorter policy. And then I have file number IJNDB-R, empowered digital use policy regulations. They are 
uh, which is much longer and it is much more detailed about what we mean by this policy and under which we can use it. So my only question is, are we, <laughs> I have no problem with waiving this because I do think it's important that we get it on the books as a policy as soon as we can. So I have no issues with that on this bill. But when we come to a vote on the policy itself, I, I guess I really need to know are we uh, approving both of these together as a, is this is our, is this our standard policy of way of doing this? The first is an introductory and then the, I'm new to the policy subcommittee. <laughs> and then the second one is the meat of the matter that really defines what would, what would be causing a breach of that policy. I see someone that trying was, to that share. Was a, that, was a, that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure who is sharing their screen, if it's Glenn or if it's, uh, uh, oh, okay, it's Dr. Hool. Okay, so, uh, Mayor Wiedergartner, you're asking. Oh, that's face coverings. <laughs> yeah, that's the face coverings one. We're, yeah. We're not there yet. Yes. I am just being tech challenged tonight, I guess. So <laughs> it, it's okay. It's a long day. It's it's a long day, and it's still a pandemic. <laughs> okay, so we all get great around us. all together. Um, yeah. You actually, um, usually, what happens is the policy is sort of the shortened school committee version. Most of the time, regulations are administrative in nature; they are not part of the policy manual. Okay. Well, in the case of something like this, that is a very important policy that the public, you know, that this, there's some deep, the devil is in the details. Your policy is sort of your guiding principles. The regulation is the details of it. Mm -hmm. In something like this, MASC, and I would agree with that, um, would uh, certainly wish, want you to think about publishing the regulations as well, because this is such an important topic. And I apologize for my tech challenges tonight, but I'm just like, whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, so those changes are things that, you know, we're really looking at in terms of, you know, trying to get, um, you know, the regulation passed as well as the policy proper. Could I comment? Please go ahead and then Member yeah. Hollins. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think. In this case, in this particular case, we need both because you do not want to get to a point in, in which someone has violated the policy and they go, I didn't know that. You know, if they haven't read the policy, then that's one thing. But if we have it as part of a total policy, there is no excuse for not understanding that policy. And Member Hollins, please go ahead. I have a couple comments. Uh, I totally, I don't totally don't have any thought about the content. Uh, I'm sure it was well thought out in terms of what it needs to say. My comments are more about process. I think it's a bad precedent to start not reviewing policies twice. We meet every two weeks. The point of that is to allow people to think about it so that if they have some thought based on discussion, they can come back to it. I also think um, the regulation is different because it's, as I read it, it's you pass it out to students, you ask them to sign it and there are consequences. And I think that's fine, students have something to sign. And anytime that changes, if we vote a regulation, if they want any detail of the change, it's got to come back to the school committee again on our agenda which is why I think unless it's imperative, we don't get involved in voting administrative regulations. Our policy really allows the superintendent to make the regulations. But my most important comment is really that if we give students something to sign and there's consequences for that, that's going to affect their schooling, they should be able to read it. And it's something that adults miss when they're writing things for students. We have a lot of students that could not read this. Uh, they can read, but not at this level. This is kind of college level, reading level. We have reading staff. So I don't have any issue with the content, but the readability should be some level that we know when students read it, 
and they have to sign it to use a computer. They, as the mayor said, there's no reason they don't understand it, but readability is really important. So I'd like to see the regulations, which look to me extremely well, well written, written for us, but I don't know if everybody in the high school can easily read this. It's pretty complicated uh, language. And we could say the same thing in language that more students could understand. So I'd actually like to see the regs uh, have a readability review so that when they come out, students sign it. It's informed consent. It's not like you have to sign this. And then I just think it's, that's really important for things we ask details of how to manage it. And I appreciate the review, but I, I don't support giving think we're voting for policy. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hollins. Other discussion? Uh, Dr. Hull, please, go ahead. Um, to uh, Member Hollins' um, point, um, we do understand that the language is probably a little bit um, readable. I think one of the things in terms of operationalizing the regulations, which would be the role of the superintendent would to make the lang make the language more kid friendly, as it were, um, in a student handbook moving forward. So that's again, um, the student handbooks are in desperate need of revision. And uh, that's something we also need to think about. So being able to translate this into kid friendly language for inclusion in the handbook, this would also be a policy we would be expecting staff to sign off on as well. So those are the two audiences, and that's that's certainly a, a you know a conflicting uh, piece of how you write uh, a regulation. But certainly, we could then take this regulation and turn it into something that's more kid friendly. And Thank just you. To, uh, Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, I think the reason we I also believe that policies should be reviewed by the school committee twice when possible. But I think there was a sense of time urgency that we're actually pretty late with implementing this policy, given that students have been um, so much online, obviously, during the remote schooling. And so the concern is that there's a lot of vulnerability for for students, for teachers, for, for the Greenfield Public Schools in the absence of this policy. And that was the reason for the request for an accelerated review. Thank you, Secretary jones Musad. Further questions, comments? Mayor Rita Gardner, sure. Uh, I, would, I would support uh, Member johnson Musad's rationale there. Just wanted to make sure that was understood. Sure. Member Hollins, another comment. Question, is it possible we could vote the policy separate from the reg? Uh, um, if not, it's okay. Just the policy seems fine. At the moment, we are on the um, deliberation We're, about whether or not to waive correct. the second reading, right? Okay. That's correct, yes. Um, so we'll we'll take that up after we, after we vote. It sounds like we could probably vote at this point um, on, on waiving the Second reading, um, Secretary Johnson Musad, could you do a roll call vote on that? Could we actually ask um, Susan Farber to read back the motion? Just want to sure. make sure. Okay, oh. the motion. <laughs> I'm here. Has to waive the to... second. I'm here. You can hear me, yes? Yes. Um, to waive the second reading of policy IJNDB and move to approve this policy this evening. Thank you. So let's go ahead and do the roll call vote. I wonder if we can uh, do a friendly amendment just to remove that last part and move to accept it. It's like we're trying to separate out the... Oh, that's a good point. Um, who made the motion? Mayor. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I did. <laughs> uh, you accept the friendly amendment? I do. Wonderful. So it would we would strike the last part of the motion or really just voting on waiving the second reading. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. 
And Secretary Johnson Mossad, I think we're now ready for real for the roll call. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Mossad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so we're gonna waive the second reading. We'll now need a motion to um, approve the policy uh, with all those letters as amended or as, as presented. So moved, Johnson Musad. Second, second, Hollins. Member Hollins with the second. Um, and discussion. Hollins. Go ahead, Member Hollins. I just want to say I'm fine with this because this is only a motion about the policy and it doesn't address the regulation, which I think needs some a wording review. Thank you. I and I'm for a question. I, uh, I wonder, okay, so Secretary Johnson Musad, go ahead, because I'm still my clearly my comment is still percolating. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I have, let me just get back to the uh, the document here for a second. Um, there it is. Okay. So, I guess my my question is: This is about um, items that may be perceived as profane, vulgar, threatening, abusive, defamatory, derogatory, inflammatory, discriminatory, or otherwise objectionable. My question is, I, I think we've seen a lot recently how a phrase can mean something about, um, about pride in one's cultural identity or sexual orientation to one group, but to someone else, it might mean something that is, uh, you know, objectionable. And, and likewise, something that might represent something about um, like Blue Lives Matter might be perceived by someone else as being, you know, connected to racial injustice. So I guess my question is, how do schools think about issues like that where it's kind of like uh, tough in both ways? And I guess my question's to, to Dr. Hull. First of all, that, that language you just read, uh, Secretary Johnson Mossad, is actually in your current policy that you have on the books. So yep. um, that is not a change. Um, it in the, the world of harassment, it is how things are perceived. It is not necessarily the intent of the person making the comment. It is how the comment is perceived by the person who is either receiving the comment directly or in earshot of said comment. So um, it, perception is king, I guess, when, when you come right down to it with regard to this stuff. And is so, the difference just that this is about email and digital platforms versus other forms of expression? Because I was looking at, maybe I'm looking at the wrong place, but I have something that says new nine and it's highlighted and that's the paragraph that's kind of, um, that's highlighted as new, but maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. Um, there are, that, there was addition to that language, but not necessarily some of that language was in the original um, policy and there was new language that was then um, put into um, that whole piece that had to do with the images as well. So that's why the change. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I see Mayor Rita Gartner and the member Hollins. Well, uh, with respect to, to um, member Hollins's opinion, regarding the policy versus the regulations. I, I do understand her point on readability. Um, and I accept uh, Dr. Hool's explanation that this policy handbook will be more readable by students. But at the end of the day, the, the guidance that the school committee needs and the administration needs comes from both the digital use policy, which is before us, but also the regulations. And I think 
as I said before, I don't see how from a legal standpoint, we can separate the two. I think, unfortunately, in this particular case, the two need to be together because the one is the overview. The second is what did, it, it answers the questions, what did I do wrong when I did X? Well, you did X wrong because it's stated in this policy that you can't do any number of things. Uh, I agree that the formatting would could have been a lot better, but, but that's neither here nor there. We can figure that one out. But it, it covers everything from offensive language and, and sexual harassment and racial disparity, racial harassment and all those things, to things like hacking and so forth all of which we know are capable of being done. So I honestly believe that we can't just accept one without accepting the other in this particular case. If we are gonna give everybody the inform information they need to know when they violate and how they might be able to violate a policy. So are you saying you would want to amend the motion to include the regulations as well? I guess that is what I just said. <laughs> I wasn't and looking I, for an amendment, but I was just stating my opinion about and, but yeah. not not just approving the policy, the first page, but yeah. the second. Well, in full full disclosure, um, I, I think I, I did miss that piece of um, putting the motion together that they do need to uh, carry forward together. And um, who, I, I can't remember who made the original motion. Glenn Johnson Mossad. Uh, so Secretary Johnson Mossad, would you accept the friendly amendment to your motion? Uh, it sounds like a substantive uh, uh, amendment, so I would withdraw the, my motion and- um, Okay. And allow someone to make a, the motion for both of them. Okay, so I could so the motion has been withdrawn, um, and I think what we're looking for is to endorse the proposed changes to the acceptable use policy and have the superintendent uh, develop changes to the regulations. Is that what we're looking for? Because the we're we're saying that we need to accept the regulations, but we're also saying there's going to be a student handbook related to this that's going to have different wording. Um, but it seems like that crosses the line, and the student handbook piece really just has to mirror what the policy has. We don't have to approve the student handbook piece. Am I thinking about this correctly? I'm not trying to make it too complicated. Um, yeah, Dr. Hool, can you help me here? <laughs> Sure. Um, basically, you could approve the regulation and then instruct uh, the interim superintendent as part of the review of the student handbook to then translate this regulation into language that could be easily understood by students or could be understood by students or however you want to phrase that. From the school committee. Yes, you could do it that way. Okay. Would someone like to make that motion? Mayor Wittgarner, are you? Mayor Wittgarter is making that motion and a second. I would, also, I would like also at some point like to comment on it, but yeah. Sure. And Me too. Do we have a second? Second, Johnson Wissad. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I think I might be the one who's having hiccups and freezing. If that's the case, I'm sorry. Um, I'm having trouble with hearing people. It keeps going in and out. You're um, coming through okay to us. It sounds like okay. you're just having a hard time hearing us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, my screen keeps jumping too, so I'm sorry if there's a confusion. Um, so a discussion, Member Hollins, go ahead. And yes, then, yeah, I'm sorry, this this is Susan Farber, just Please, checking in about the wording of the motion. Um, I My understanding is that it's no longer called the acceptable use policy. Empowered. So um, I might su suggest that based on what you said, it Thank reads you. now, um, the motion is to endorse the proposed changes to policy IJNDB and IJNDBR and have the superintendent develop changes to the regulations and, inst 
and instruct her as part of the student handbook review to translate into language that could easily be understood by students. As the Thank member, you, Susan Farber. <laughs> yes, go ahead. As the member who made the motion, I, I would agree that she has read it correctly it, with the intent that I intended. Thank you. Okay, uh, Member Hollins with her comment and then Mayor Rita Gardner, please. Yes, I, I support the what what you're doing and I particularly support everything the mayor says. Um, you know, we have six policies just on policy. So if if you want the regulation to be a policy, which is kind of confusing to me, why don't we take those points that everyone is saying is so important that should be policy and have a second policy on this? not a regulation, but a second policy that says, uh, you know, like the basic issues that aren't allowed. We, we have a few policies like that on different topics and have a second school committee policy and leave how it's going to be implemented to the superintendent, which is the regulation. So I'm not disagreeing with the intent, but making a regulation a policy and then rewriting it it's, it's a confusing way to go. Why not take the mayor's point on the critical things we need to say to students? Just have a second policy on this and then leave a regulation for the superintendent to implement and have it be a regulation. So, and make it readable. <laughs> That's all. It's a good job. Other for questions are, oh, I'm sorry, Mayor Rita Gardner, go ahead. Well, actually, um, I, I think again, with respect, I I do not necessarily agree on that that point. We don't need another policy to confirm a policy. As far as I'm concerned, we need to be very clear about what our policy is, IJNDB, and then we need to be very clear. Could be part of IJNDB, but in an abbreviated format what you might do that would cause you to violate that policy. That is the piece that I think is most important. But I, at the same time, I, I heard some reference to the, it seems like an hour ago, but I think it was only a few minutes ago, with regard to the, to the, pol to the handbook. And, and someone stated, and we don't approve, the school, school committee doesn't approve the handbook, but I actually do believe the school committee does approve the handbook. So we have an opportunity the second time around. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm to sorry. To see what was in, what, how it was stated in the handbook. Thank you, I appreciate that clarification. I, yeah. I have yet to vote on a school committee, or a, a student handbook. I do look forward yeah. to that um, yeah. <laughs> life event. Yes, it, it will be. <laughs> the, yeah, the most recent version I can find goes back to 2016. I can't find anything, and uh, the principals have confirmed that it has not been updated since then. So um, that's on the to do list. That was pre pandemic, <laughs> pre remote learning, pre a whole lot of things. <laughs> um, dare we say pre Trump? Might have been, right? Don't say that. <laughs> Okay, uh, so further discussion on this before we move to a vote. Isn't policy like fun? To, Are we all having fun here? I, I would like to see that motion again if she wants to put it in the chat or restate it. Just sure. It. Susan Farber, do you mind helping us with what the motion is that we're going to vote on? It's it's on it. I missed whatever. I lost I'm your audio, sure Susan Farber. Oh, it's not she's me. Not okay. Yeah. Susan, oh, she's putting it in the chat, it looks like. Okay. All right. So, are we ready for a roll call vote? I'm not hearing any further discussion. So Secretary Johnson Musad, please go ahead. Member Karen. Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom. Yes. Member Hollins. I'll abstain. Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti. Yes. Member Wall. Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner. 
Yes. Motion carries with one abstention. Thank you. Policy work, ma'am. You think it's going to be simple. <laughs> and never, ever is simple. It's like a ripple effect, too. Okay, so that was the acceptable use now renamed as, I already forgot Empower the name of it. Empowered um, digital use policy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and at emergency closure, we have to also tackle this one tonight. Is that right? Are we no. ready for this one? Okay. Remind me. I'm so sorry. I've lost all track of this one. Uh, yeah. So this was the one that um, where we asked the superintendent at a future meeting to please yes. update the policy so that any emergency closure that lasts more than three days would require school committee approval. And that's not ready for us tonight. So we'll look forward Thank to that you. at the next opportunity. As soon as you started talking, it all came back to yep. Secretary Johnson Musab. Thank you. Um, okay, so we will move on at this point um, to the redrawing discussion. That's item eight on the agenda. Um, and w there's a couple of things that have um, that have come up related to this project that we kind of just want to um, make clear. And I'm going to kind of have a back and forth here with uh, Member Wall on this project. Uh, so th the first thing is, um, this was intended, always intended to be uh, pro most likely a multi-year project. You can't just decide we're gonna move students around in different buildings and have that happen easily or quickly. And we also, of course, want to have stakeholders involved and be transparent, like with anything else we're doing on a major scale like this. Um, and so uh, when I spoke with Member Wall um, offline about this, she, Member Wall, I'm going to put you on the spot because you explained our goals for this very well um, in terms of what we're actually trying to do, uh, what we hope the outcome will be by looking at redrawing the district map. Can you help me out here? Absolutely. After we have carefully evaluated the racial and economic inequality in the school system, the conclusion that we have reached is that having three or four elementary schools is the problem, that the children are all uh, in, the, all the children in a grade level are together from the time they get in the middle school. The inequality on any level is in the elementary schools because we have three or four different ones. And the problem is how to solve that so that we can have all of the children together in their grade group throughout their uh, entire time in the Greenfield school system. So that's the problem. Okay. So looking at uh, everything, the, the goal basically is to identify a way that we can have students travel almost as a grade cohort from one grade to the next through the schools. Yes. Um, thank you for that. And then in terms of our timeline, I mean, is this gonna happen for April 5th, Member Wall? Are we gonna be ready to go then? <laughs> I had discussed it with the soup, the interim superintendent at our first meeting, which was seems like years ago, and as a possibility while everything was in chaos and all everybody was not coming back to school at the same time, et cetera, that this would be a good time to implement it, not knowing that April the 5th is when we had to have the elementary school back for five days a, a week. So this is an yeah. impossible situation and I apologize for even suggesting. Oh, you don't need to apologize. <laughs> you do not need to apologize. Um, I just like to, when we can, walk through things very specifically so there's no confusion about what we're trying to do or why we're trying to do it. So our timeline really um, could be, this is a multi-year thing at this point. Um, and I, I'm, I would, we don't need to um, take, make any sort of motion or take any vote on this, but we do need to encourage folks to 
uh, get involved. This is an advisory committee, so the community can be involved in this process. And um, as these meetings are posted, we encourage folks to get involved. And if folk, if anyone has uh, comments to make, they can always make them to the full school committee by email um, or uh, directly to Member Wall, who is managing um, this monumental task for us, as well as the uh, superintendent search committee. Um, and I would at then at this point also look for any very um, narrow discussion of this uh, from the school committee right now, questions or narrow discussion related to just these pieces of moving forward. Mayor Wiedegartner, please go ahead. So I, I clearly appreciate all the work that the, the advisory committee did. Um, and I know that they were in good hands with um, member Wong. Uh, but I do fully support the idea that this is a multi-year policy. And I, when we say that, it is not, and I want the public to understand this in particular, we are not dodging the issue, but it involves many things. If we are going to do what we ask, what, what I think I hear I'm saying, so maybe we don't have as much information and perhaps it, a, a, a shorter school commit, shorter business meeting on school committee with this as a singular topic or one of two or three would be a good idea. Because uh, if you're going to reduce the number of school buildings that you're using, then we as a city need to decide what we're going to do with the others. So if I'm counting correctly, we have four active school buildings and a fifth one perhaps coming online, which is Green River School. So it, it, it involves financial, serious financial implications for the city as a whole. What do we do with those buildings that are not being used? I, I understand fully what the, um, what the impetus for uh, grades traveling together is. Um, and I understand the history of Greenfield as wanting neighborhood schools, something that might have been important at one point in time in Greenfield's history, but may not be be useful now for all the reasons that we're discussing, the potential for discrimination, the potential for segmentation, et cetera. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that when we say this is not something we're going to decide tonight or tomorrow night, uh, the next meeting or the meeting after that, it needs a real planful discussion that that also includes what do we do with the buildings that we are not using and how do we either utilize them as city buildings or utilize and keep them <laughs> bad discussion but a bad word but mothballed for future use because we see right now you know with one pandemic maybe hopefully we won't have another one for another 118 years but in which case none of us will be around but <laughs> We do need to know um, how we're going to handle the, the building uses afterwards. Mm -hmm. I would like to see an administration building where you don't have to go through several doors, security into a tiny little area, and that we can reutilize the area that is being used for administration for classrooms. So that's just one suggestion. Thank you, Mayor. Member Hollins, I see your hand. Go ahead. Comment. Yes, um, I agree with everything the mayor said again. I, I think part of our discussion needs to be how are we going to use Green River School? But what I want to say is at the end of the day, what everybody wants on the school committee is to make sure our students, particularly our young students, learn to the fullest. And there's so much research available. I hope we can bring some of this into the discussion. An area that's highly researched is what happens to students, how many times they change schools. So I just want to say, aside from our own interest and our own opinion, there's so much information out there about school configuration, children moving, sustainability of their academic gains. I just hope some of that is included in a significant project like this. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hollins. Other comments? I do want to apologize for those to those who are on the advisory committee that think we're going to have a meeting at nine o'clock tomorrow morning <laughs> i did not remember to get it posted 48 hours ahead of time 
So the meeting cannot happen, those of you who are here tonight. I am so sorry. But our regularly scheduled meetings are the second uh, Thursday at 9 o'clock in the morning and the fourth Thursday at 6 o'clock in the evening so that we could have a diversity of people. And now that you know where we're headed in this discussion, maybe more people would be interested in coming and participating in this long-term discussion. Thank you, Member Wall. Comments? Other questions? Yes, Secretary Johnson, with that, go ahead. Just briefly that I think both on the Racial Justice Advisory Committee and on the redrawing redistricting, we see the connections with, with racial justice and racial equity in our schools. and. Um, I think that the committees will be figuring out, you know, within the laws, within open meeting law, how to how to kind of uh, have feedback back and forth, and how not to be competing with each other for uh, for members on these groups. So we'll we'll figure that out together mm -hmm. as time goes through. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Secretary Johnson. We said any other comment on this. Okay, thank you all. I think I think having these periodic check-ins around stuff like this is important. And I do kind of feel like an all-star DJ tonight because now we're going to shift right into the Green River School project. The mayor had already brought it up. This is very connected to what we have for space and how we count what we're using for space. Um, and we do have an update on uh, this item this evening. I am wondering... Uh, so I'll start and Dr. Hool, if I miss anything or Mayor Wiedegartner, if I miss anything on this, just jump in and, and help me out here. So last year, it, w it was about a year ago um, the we started discussing uh, replacing or I guess it, installing. I don't even know if there's an actual heating system in Green River School. Regardless, it needs to be replaced, upgraded. Uh, it, 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 it just needs to happen. And we uh, began the process of working with the city uh, to fund that project. And the city um, it approved uh, $416,000 for this project about a year ago. And we have learned, so obviously pandemic hits, um, the project was slowed to a grinding halt for a number of reasons. Um, not the least of which is uh, it just uh, any any kind of project like this uh, during a pandemic has hurdles related to supply um, and uh, project management and all those things, of course. So the cost is no longer in the range of $416,000 if it actually ever was. Um, it sounds like that was way too low. Um, and I, I don't know any of the details around that, but it does sound like we need um, to approve uh, like another four, I, I don't have the exact amount, but we need to be prepared to approve like another $430,000 for this that is not going to come from uh, the city. They are not going to fund that piece of it. So uh, that is my understanding. And then uh, I would give uh, Dr. Houle and, and Mayor Rita Gardner a chance to add anything that I've missed here. I, I'm ha because of uh, Dr. Hool, we're putting her a little bit on the spot because she's evolving in her understanding of this. I'm I'm happy to start answering those questions. That's kind of why I, you include I included you. So what did I miss there? What did I miss? Well, you, didn't, you didn't miss a whole lot, a timing wise. I think you're you're off a little bit. It was actually, if I'm not mistaken, and again, I don't have the full notes, but I do have the emails which. At some point, I could certainly share with the committee. Um, it was closer to four hundred and sixty thousand. I believe it was authorized. Well, it was authorized long before last year because I was here last year, and I know that it was not authorized in my tenure. So it might have been 2016, 2017, okay. possibly even twenty eighteen. I'm sorry. Okay, 
Yeah, and that's Thank fine. It, it's just a small detail. I just want people to understand Thank that, you. that, you know, it predated uh, certainly my arrival and probably everybody on this committee. Now, Susan Hollins may have some recollection of it, although maybe not. It may have occurred after her, her tenure as superintendent. Um, it was done out of necessity because the building itself was had a failing heating system, which I think actually just up and quit one day. <laughs> and, and we had to decide what to do uh, in that respect. I do believe the school was empty at that point in time, was not being used. So, so it, it would is, have been after the Math and Science Academy had been. Yeah, there. yeah, I believe it was. Um, math, now, math, and science, math and Science was moved so the heating system could be fixed, whatever yeah, you Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think that is, I think uh, Dr. Hollins is, is absolutely correct about that. Um, it, 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 it meant that they had to, <laughs> had to move, um, is my recollection. It is hampered uh, to a certain extent. Well, it's not hampered. What else is involved is that uh, it, uh, any money that goes into it has to go into it to be used as a school. So that's very important to keep in mind. It could not be an Thank administration you. building. It could, you know, yeah. it has to be an educational institution. And that's because some funding has come from the state. Is that correct? Yes, that is okay. correct. Thank you. So where the money got involved, um, I, I'm, I didn't reread the emails, but a estimate was put forward at that particular time several years ago about what might be the cost. And just as an example of how costs rise over time um, and how perhaps, again, predates me, but I, I keep getting updates from either Carol Collins, our energy director, or George uh, Vandalinder, who is the central maintenance person who was involved in this, um, we may have inadequately assessed what the level of the heating system needed to be. I don't, I don't know that, but it seems like that might have been the case, because he very recently had, in his effort to do due diligence on behalf of the Green River School, because he knew it would become very important as we began to deal with the pandemic, and as he was charged to do, I think, by the council to like come on, we need an answer. <laughs> when are we going to have Green River School online? And uh, doc, uh, our previous superintendent had a couple of different ideas for that, but they, they never were fully fleshed out. Um, so um, the council was becoming impatient with not seeing where their money was being spent. Um, so Time passes and now we have a figure of closer to 900 and change for, for a heating system for a building that size that meets all of the codes and standards that have now been developed probably almost as a result of the pandemic. So on, on the one hand, it will be um, up to date, but it's going to cost us. And so, so I think that's that's the short version of the way that I could provide some history, and I can certainly provide the committee with the the emails, which are quite detailed, that I have from George Vandalender of how we got to this price. Yeah, but I can't do okay. it. I can't do it tonight. Oh, no, and that's fine. I think this is just kind of yeah. uh, we have some new information on this project. Yeah. We need to to to. Uh, make the school committee uh, and, and the school administration aware that this yeah. is coming. And then at, I think our next step, unless I'm reading this wrong, is that we have to work um, as a, a district to identify where the money's going to come from for this. Yeah, I don't know that we need a vote of anything tonight. No. It's an informational piece, right? Right, but right. Yeah. Ex unless, Dr. Hool, did you have anything you would want to add to this at this point? No, I think uh, the mayor's um, right that there's not really a vote required this evening. It's that we've got to now figure out how we're going to uh, fund that and for what purpose might the building be used. Okay. And uh, member, Ac Vice Chair Ekstrom, perhaps a subcommittee meeting for budget is warranted based so you can have this as an agenda item. Does that I'm work? Sure. Yes, I'm sure it is. 
This is member Karen. Member Karen, go ahead. Um, so I've been working on this Green River heating thing as a, the chair of the health safety committee for a <laughs> long time. Okay. And I don't really remember it exactly the same way. Um, we wanted to get a program in there. We had it as fleshed mm-hmm. out as we could, but we were yes. waiting bids from the city. This predates our current mayor, not mm-hmm. from the city, but like from the people who would put the heating system in and we kept not getting them. And then mm-hmm. it took a really long time and you had to have more than one bid and we didn't get more than one bid. So we had to keep waiting. <laughs> and then we asked the city council for money and they said, yes. So I'm not really sure. I would really like to see those emails because I'm certain I'm missing some steps in there. Um, but I also don't remember that the reason we moved the math and science academy had anything to do with the heating system. We had like a whole team called the star team advisory committee. It was like my first foray into town Mm -hmm. stuff. And we met to discuss what we should do about reorganizing the schools, because at that time it was K through three at the elementary schools, four and five and six and seven were at the middle school. And our suggestion was to move the math and science academy into the middle school and move fourth grade back mm-hmm. to the elementary schools. Mm-hmm. They happen to work out at the same time, which often happens if a heating system is limping along and then you turn it off, <laughs> not off clearly, but you know, lower its usage, it decides <laughs> I'm ready for retirement and it shuts itself off. That's a yeah. pretty common thing that happens. Um, so I would really like to see more information. I appreciate all of the research and a lot of this has happened mid pandemic, post mayoral change, school committee change, and it's a lot. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I all in, we need to figure it out. We got to figure out where the money comes from, but that's pre current mayor details are a little different than I remember. So I would like to see the chain of information. And I, I think that what what a member Karen has described is is tangentially because I was on the outside but paying attention because it involves schools and city schools. So just as a citizen, um, because I go back to when it was actually renovated and it was clearly an elementary school that I think either went to just three or four, four. And I think she's right. It was K through three back then. Um, so. Um, She's right. Uh, I think her recollections are are spot on. Uh, I don't know so much about the Math and Science Academy, but that even sounds a little bit right. I'm just giving you more updates from what I know, having started to look at this, understanding that it would become an issue both for the city in how it gets funded, but also for the school committee. Amy, you're on mute. Comment? I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Rita Gardner. Uh, So (laughs) Member Hollins and then Member Wall. Well, I do think uh, the suggestion to go back and get some history is really important. So we're not getting former Superintendent Ruscio uh, giving some history about the school and Green River was K to five. Ruscio closed it. It was then by an interim superintendent became a special ed school. And then I reused it for something. But the point is there's a motion of the school committee about uh, temporarily moving it. I remember the motion. And so that will clarify under what conditions it was uh, temporary that Math and Science Academy moved. I, I think I also like Katie. I've been talking about this school for years, <laughs> and what I and it would just be interesting to clarify it because it it wasn't just heating. We had a grant for heating or something, and then the controls to make the heating work weren't included. So then we had to go out to bid for the heating controls. It just kept getting more complicated and confused. So putting that all together, but the main issue is, I think when we do a space utilization study of our three elementary schools we're going this is my hunch that we're going to find my hunch if we look at it i i think when former principal to me put in a request for an addition at four corners it wasn't for no reason it's because they needed more space and i think taking away a floor of the middle school for administrative offices was part of what uh it's 
I just think putting the history together is a really good idea. There's a lot of history about repairs on that building and decisions and moving. And but originally it was K to five. All the elementary schools were K to five. Thank you. Thank thank you. It Other was. Part, when, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it was when we built the high school that it all got top, topsy turvy because uh, okay. we had to figure out where to put high school students and so forth. And I, that may have been part of Susan Hollins's tenure, or maybe started with Russo. But yeah, that 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 was um, a mess. But it it got the job done. And but I do think it is where we got crosswise. I would I would submit that as part of the history as well. Thank you, Member Wall. Go ahead. Yes, as, as the chair of planning and construction, I remember that we talked about the Green River School at length and that uh, member that Carol Collins told us that the uh, money that had been asked for by the school superintendent to do the repairs were not going to get us the type of heating system that we needed uh, for the building. And so we tried to get it all changed. And I don't think that there was ever uh, an agreement on what the building was to be used for. But I do remember that I went to the uh, city council in 2020 and they voted at that time that they wanted the building heated because they felt it was deteriorating sitting yeah. there with no heating system yeah. and then it nothing was ever done that was what, and so it doesn't really matter at this point the money was voted in 2020 it was not spent it was at probably adequate at that time and now it's increased <laughs> exponentially and we need to figure out what's going to be what the building's going to be used for. This is Member Thank Karen you, Member again. Wong. Member Karen, go ahead. Sorry, um, we actually did vote to put a program in there. It was a uh, alternative high school program meant for kids who weren't um, necessarily following the perfect high school track and to give them a second chance, or if they were working, they had to work to support a family and they needed a different alternative schedule. We had a program ready to go. Mm -hmm. Certain we could Aaron Pat nodes uh, right up. It was good. I mean, it wasn't completely fleshed out because we couldn't do anything till we had a heating system. But I want to say it was 2019 that we got that. Like, I think um, I think you're right. It's 2019 that the vote was taken, not 2020. That was just I last year, believe it or not. Uh, I think he probably has the date right for when they voted for the money again, because we did ask a couple of times when it was going to happen. It was like a lot of back and forth. Um, but the program probably was forward in 2019 and then moved probably September 19 and then moved from there. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so we will continue to move forward on this and. Um, uh, it sounds like we need to get some more updates and um, I will work with the city side as well as uh, Dr. Hool to get the information that we need to um, it, it be historically accurate and have a chronology of what and when uh, so that we don't make the same mistakes twice, which is never fun in municipal <laughs> or city or uh, school financing, right? Okay, so we've beat that one to death, I think. Um, thank you all. Now, I think what everyone is waiting for, I know I'm anxious to hear the updates here from uh, Dr. Hool on uh, in-person instruction. I'm going to turn it over to her at this point. And um, we've talked ahead of time about this and that um, there's a few decision points for the school committee tonight. So we'll get the, the overview, the introduction, and then we'll work through those. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hopefully this time uh, sharing is a charm and you have the right file in the right place on your screen. Um, so just wanted to update you as to uh, where we are with return to in-person learning. Um, this is a work in progress, needless to say. So I'm going to begin with the commissioner's plan. 
on Friday um, of this past week. Yeah, there was a two hour board meeting, which I listened to while I was working to see what uh, was going to go on. Um, at the end of the meeting, it was voted to return to full time in person learning five days per week um, in three phases. Um, and they, um, how they did this was a change to the uh, structured learning time regulations. Um, and they gave the commissioner um, the authority to do this on an emergency basis, which basically says once full time in person learning by these benchmarks was to happen, that um, remote and hybrid uh, hours would no longer count as structured learning time. So that's how um, we have gotten to this point. Um, that said, parents and caregivers who have who desire to have their child um, educated remotely for the rest of the school year do have that option. So the first phase of the program is um, to bring elementary school uh, children in grades K through five, and we'll talk about the fifth grade piece in a little bit, um, back to school on April 5th, uh, to then phase in middle school on April 28th, and from there to do high school at a date yet to be determined. Um, but after my call with the commissioner uh, today, um, that seems to be forthcoming fairly soon. Um, the background that he gave to a lot of this was, of course, back in the beginning, it was all about six feet of separation between desks, et cetera, et cetera, and schools not having the physical capacity to bring students back full time. He presented some studies um, where they have looked at the impact of um, both staff and student rates with regard to whether it's three feet apart or six feet apart. And there has been shown really no statistically significant difference over time um, between those two metrics. So that's uh, where he was coming from with regard to this. So we have um, developed an in-person learning uh, command structure to address um, the plan. And so um, just to begin with this process is just to make everybody aware that we do have in-person um, activities happening at this particular point in time within the, in the school system. Our high needs um, special education students and staff are on site and engaged in uh, in-person learning with all of the proper precautions that are, are necessary. Um, you as a school committee voted at your last meeting to have fall two athletics, which is an in-person uh, activity as well. Uh, and I've received a request from uh, the GHS um, Audiovisual Club to begin meeting indoors and um, can do that um, quite safely within the spaces that we're looking at, which would either be the lecture hall at the high school or in the auditorium with about 10 to 12 students. So there's certainly far and enough uh, space for that to happen. So, you know, people, I just want people to understand that there is a context and that there are in-person activities going on within the schools currently already. But as we look to amp this up a little bit, um, what we have done is basically used um, what's known as a critical incident command structure um, for responding to uh, such uh, momentous occasions as this. And so um, we have a set of teams there's a team for every school. Um, they all have a crisis team, which they have enacted um, to be the steering committee at each school building level. Um, there is a support services uh, team that's being led by um, the SPED director, a facilities team, a food service team, finance, because obviously there are things that we want to be uh, tracking with regard to all of that, um, a technology team, and then a transportation team. And those teams are meeting um, most of them have already met at least once, and then uh, the team leaders from each of those uh, forms then the sort of the command center, as it were, um, and we're meeting right now two times a week. Uh, at a minimum, I have a feeling that'll amp up pretty quickly, but to be able to receive information from each of the smaller teams and then have a coordinated effort to try and uh, respond to questions or to think about things that need to happen. So that's been put in place. Our first and foremost priority in this process is student and staff safety, and I can't stress that enough. Um, that's where we're 
focused on. And uh, at some point, we'll have a nice little infographic that will look way better than my boring slide here. But uh, basically, we're looking at four things. Wear a mask, wash and sanitize your hands, stay apart, and stay home if you don't feel well. And we're really going to push that messaging um, so that hopefully everybody from the youngest student to uh, the oldest employee um, should be able to uh, say those four things pretty easily. Um, so we'll work through what that means. We'll get some messaging out to the community around that, but we just want to really, you know, sort of set the stage with the daily four. Um, the second um, set of things that we've done is um, some things are to begin um, the mitigation process so that we're sure that the environments are uh, safe. One of the things that came out in the middle of our conversation with the commissioner um, this morning was that the governor announced that there will be four dedicated days for um, educator vaccinations, March 27th, April 3rd, April 10th, and April 11th. Those will be done at the mass vaccination sites like the Eastfield Mall um, and other places like that. Uh, they will not be done at regional sites because there still is there are still issues with getting vaccine supply to smaller regional sites. So um, this was the governor's um, announcement to be able to do it in this way. Um, I am also aware because I have teacher friends from other districts who have actually come to the Greenfield CVS to be vaccinated. So, um, you know, again, we're gonna encourage staff to don't wait for us to call you. If you can find a vaccination somewhere, go get it. Um, and um, again, work with, with uh, our educational staff on getting uh, vaccines either more locally as they can find them or um, to visit one of the mass vaccination clinics, which means, you know, you could take a trip to Fenway or, uh, you know, Gillette Stadium. Um, I think Alan's already been to Gillette Stadium with uh, an elderly parent, so he's had that thrill um, and uh, all of that business. So that's one of the mitigation steps that is taking place. Currently, we are assessing our classroom and school uh, capacities with regard to um, taking a look at what, what we can house, whether or not we need to use other spaces as instructional spaces, cafeterias, gymnasiums, because classrooms can't hold that. Um, we are looking at um, something within the, the, between the six and the three foot um, range of separation for desks um, or tables with students um, because uh, been in all of the elementary schools uh, so far and looked at classroom spaces and even using some of the, um, you know, trapezoid tables, um, the tables can be separated enough so that children can be basically what I call nose to nose could be six feet apart. Um, so um, making sure that at least that um, is happening. Obviously, Things that have to be solved is that if we're using a cafeteria as a teaching space, how do we have children eating breakfast and lunch and those kinds of things? Those are questions we don't have fully the answers to yet, um, but we're working to get our way there. Um, we've done study of HVAC. We have air purifiers. We've been working very closely with the city to get air purifiers um, on site as soon as possible. Um, we're using emergency procurement and uh, I wanna thank the mayor um, for her role in really helping to push this along so that we make sure that we have um, air purifiers in place in all of the classrooms that need it um, by April 5th for the elementary children and then shortly thereafter for everybody else. Um, cafeteria wise, we're looking at probably grab and go meals. Um, again, just to avoid um, having issues around uh, trying to separate things and uh, keep students physically distant, um, and then having some flexibility over places that students can eat. I mean, the commissioner was even talking about things like, and we, in his guidance, and we had some discussion today at our IPL meeting around, you know, maybe half the kids go out for recess while half the kids eat and vice versa, so that we can, again, um, you know, try and minimize uh, contact. So those are all things are, that we're work, trying to work our, through, our way through. Um, we've got cleaning protocols that are in place on in both of our schools and our buses. 
Um, so that uh, I met with um, the folks from Kuzmeskis as well as our own internal folks um, the other day and talked about uh, the protocols that are in place. Drivers have been trained um, and our custodial staff has been trained and uh, making sure that we have everything that we need. Um, we're looking at pooled testing. And so now I'll toss the ball to Alan if you want to uh, talk a little bit about that, Alan. Thank you very much, Dr. Hool. Um, good evening, everybody. I just want to let you know that uh, as a former school committee member, I feel 15 or 20 years younger uh, attending these meetings. So thank you for that. Um, who knew pool testing would become a second job for um, our director of special education, Janet Dickinson, and our school nurses? Um, the devil is in the details, and there are plenty of those to go around. Uh, the bottom line is that more than half of the districts um, are taking advantage of this program that the state is picking up the tab on through April 16th. And um, it allows, it's one more step in the mitigation strategy that we um, are able to test large numbers of staff and students to make sure that we can identify if there are any COVID cases. Um, there is a tremendous amount of logistics behind this. Um, I can't thank Janet enough and um, all of our nurses, um, Rebecca and Claire and uh, Pam, uh, Jen and Kelly, uh, Hannah. Terrific work. Um, it's the second job to put this together, but I believe it will pay off both in terms of the comfort level uh, that we have going forward as well as to give uh, instant um, notification um, if we do have to deal with any cases. Um, I, I listened uh, with the, the two opening comments and certainly everybody has concerns. I think that the these um, pooled testing uh, will certainly uh, help go a long way towards making this, um, as, as Dr. Hool said, the safest possible return to in-person learning. Um, the other, as I waded through the commissioner's guidance, there's almost 80% of districts across the Commonwealth that are back in person or in hybrid model. So um, the, the cases that have been tracked across the state in schools are very, very minimal. Um, and I can I continue to be very positive that when you put all of these uh, mitigation strategies together, that we will be able to provide our kids and our staff with the healthiest opportunity to return to in-person learning. I think that um, the plan will be to um, start the pooled testing the week of March 22nd, and with those two weeks, before April 5th, we would be able to um, address any issues uh, on the logistics and the protocols. Um, and I know that the letters are going to Dr. Hool for consent and for information for everybody. Um, but I do believe that this is a, an important part um, that will allow us to return to in-person learning. So again, thanks to, to our Director of Special Ed and to our nurses who have just taken this on and have really um, managed all of these details with tremendous um, compassion and expertise. So well done. Thanks, Alan. Um, Thanks. Yeah, the, the, the hope is that um, we would get one sample from everyone per week there would be two opportunities for testing. So if a, a student was absent on a certain day, um, that we'd pick them up on the second day. So the hope is to be able to do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, the principals have been uh, drafted into the roles of being champions for their schools, and I get to be the champion for Central Office. Woohoo! Um, so, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's just basically making sure that uh, everything uh, goes the way it's supposed to do. If a poll comes back with a positive result, then there is what's known as a Binax test that happens uh, later to try and narrow down the contact so that uh, they can be contact tracing and all of that business that happens. It's a pretty stringent set of protocols that have to be followed, uh, and we will certainly continue to do that. 
the other mitigation step that uh, we will be taking place again with uh, DESE guidance on um, February 11th, the governor lifted all uh, capacity restrictions on buses. So buses can run at full capacity, but they must run with windows in the uh, roof hatch open. So uh, it could still be chilly in April. So uh, dress warmly. Um, there will be assigned seats. It will be mask wearing mandated on um, all of the buses. So again, um, doing all of those things that we really need to do to make sure that um, you know transportation goes as well as it possibly can. Uh, fortunately, April can also have some nice warm days in it as well. And can we utilize outdoor spaces as places for teaching and learning? Our kids have been behind screens for a very long time. This is perfect opportunity to make use of outdoor spaces to do hands-on projects or, um, you know, take a look at nature and all that's happening in the springtime and, uh, you know, making those science and uh, interdisciplinary tie-ins um, that, you know, creative teachers can do um, when they have those opportunities. So again, we're encouraging people to just make use of a lot of uh, varied and creative ways um, to be able to deliver instruction upon return. Um, and then the, the other thing that we're going to be encouraging people to do is making good decisions. We know particularly with uh, high school friends that um, decision making uh, is not always their strong suit. So making sure that they are following guidelines outside of school in terms of mask wearing and contact and all of those things. Um, we will be encouraging families to uh, remind them that there are very few states that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts considers safe to travel to. So there is an April break coming up. Um, and so, you know, people just need to be mindful that um, if you might want to think twice about whether or not you're going to travel, if you're going to be participating uh, in um, in-person learning. And then just personal precautions. You know, we want to make sure that everybody is doing what they need to do with regard to um, all of the precautions that we're asking folks to uh, take uh, on a personal level as well. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, we had a discussion about this at our uh, IPL command today, and somebody said something about, you know, kids having, you know, you know, potentially wiping down desks and whatever. And I said, you know, this is sort of like the first day of school in the fall. You know, you have classroom expectations. This might be one of those expectations you set and make sure that everybody knows what they're doing and uh, how they need to do it using hand sanitizer, all of those things. So, um, those are uh, things that we have uh, in, in place. And I did appreciate the comment that was made earlier about the survey. It is very difficult to um, make a decision on a survey. We were just trying to get a first read. This is not the only survey we will be doing of, of parents and guardians to kind of figure out where things are going and that as more information becomes available, uh, parents will be able to make, you know, the best decision that they feel they can make for um, their children. But um, we did uh, run a preliminary run of the survey, even though it's not fully closed yet, but just to see where we stood. Um, so we asked folks um, the likelihood of their students returning to in-person learning. And it was interesting, you'll notice in all of these graphs, uh, there's one for the elementary, one for GMS, and uh, one for the high school. and. Across the board, we're about 24% of the population saying they're not likely to return. Um, whether or not that number will decrease or increase as more details come out will remain to be seen. So that's why we'll be doing another dip once we um, figure that out. So um, you can see that 45% of um, elementary uh, families are very likely to return. 14% are likely, 17% uh, not yet decided, and 24% thinking they're going to stay remote. Uh, similar numbers at uh, the middle school, um, pretty much uh, a theme rolling along here as you take a look at the numbers, and also at the high school. Uh, again, uh, pretty similar kinds of numbers with uh, regard to um, the likelihood of students returning uh, to in-person learning. Um, we also asked about the scenarios um, in which students might return uh, to school, and 37% of the folks said so long as masks and proper physical distancing protocols were in place, they felt comfortable enough sending their students back. Um, we did ask the hybrid question, but that was before um, the commissioner's um, 
return um, vote happened, so hybrid's kind of off the table at this point. We did ask if we people needed an all clear from health experts, as it were. 28% um, said yes. The other scenarios, the likelihood of returning, again, some questions were being asked around the details of, of the plan to reopen moving forward. And again, we're working our way towards that moment. Uh, transportation preferences. Um, this was very interesting to me. Um, only 18% said they would have their children ride the bus. Um, so what does that mean to bus routes, et cetera? 49% um, of the folks said they would transport their own children to school. Um, so that, again, that was interesting. 12% walking to school. And again, 21% of the respondents said they were going to plan to um, participate remotely. So again, it's in line with that sort of 21-25% uh, um, thinking that they want to stay remote. Um, asked, we asked about participation in the meals program um, and did preface that with the fact that the meals program uh, will continue to be free. Um, again, 56% of uh, the respondents said they were very likely to participate in the program. Uh, 13 and 12 on the somewhat or occasionally and 19% said that they would not at all participate in the program. So again, these just begin to help inform our strategy moving forward. And then we asked the question if people would be interested in a public forum uh, to learn more about the reentry plan. 66%, uh, which was 593 respondents, uh, said they would be interested. So I think this will be multiple forums because uh, trying to moderate 600 people at once is, is a little challenging. Um, and then the other 300 and some odd, um, uh, you know, chose, uh, said that they would not be interested in the public forum. Um, so our next steps um, is obviously some uh, community engagement. We wanna keep people regularly informed about our process, be very transparent about what we're doing and how we're doing it, offer those uh, public forums, um, working with the principals uh, as they're getting their classrooms spaced out and getting things prepped, that we can uh, do some virtual tours. Uh, TMS has a uh, videographer on staff who can come down and kind of uh, put a virtual tour uh, piece together, hopefully even include buses and all of that and, and whatnot, so that um, we can post those online so that people could watch a virtual tour of what is what would a classroom look like, you know, how are the halls marked out, you know, some of those kinds of things. So we'll um, work on getting those done um, very shortly. Um, we're obviously working, uh, continuing our planning for space and transportation needs, um, and then working with our faculty and staff that as they identify challenges, how are we going to work together to find solutions to those challenges? I'm a can-do person, so I'm not uh, necessarily one who uh, wants to get a roadblock and say, oh, we can't do this. There, there, there needs to be some way that we can meet the challenges. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that, uh, you know, all hands on deck, we'll, we'll get this done. Um, obviously, we'll be doing additional surveys to gather more specific uh, information. Our IPL command meetings will meet a couple of times per week, more often if needed. And, um, we may need some more frequent school committee meetings just uh, batting down the hatches over the next couple of weeks because there will be some key decision points. We'll be only be able to take it so far and then it, it uh, falls into your lap. So uh, just uh, kind of keeping that um, in the thing. And that's sort of the end of the thing. So uh, of the presentation proper. So I am gonna stop sharing for a minute. Um, and uh, ask if there are any questions. And then I do have one policy item that uh, we need to kind of think about together. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hull. I appreciate that um, very thorough overview. So let's start with a comment from Mayor Wiedegartner. You're on mute. It's actually a question, and it's a question on pool testing. Um, and I know because uh, Jennifer Hoffman is working also on that program that you've been doing a lot of good work on that, and I appreciate that. And I actually happen to have occasion to sign the grant. Uh, and that's where my question begins, because if I understood uh, Mr. Himmelberger properly, 
that um, that grant, uh, which I seem to have signed, you know, I don't know, 400 years ago, um, was um, only goes to April 16th. That's the way I understood it, which of course we all know is around the corner. So I'm really happy to hear you are at least starting it in March uh, to get somehow or other get it working. But it begs the question, I think we will need to continue it. So do we have a sense beyond the grant what the expense will be and how we will pay for it? Um, prior to my arrival, there was some um, set aside of some funds to continue past the funding of the grant. Um, now that we have a date certain when the grant will end, it will be a case of doing some cost analysis and figuring out exactly what that cost is. Um, we set aside some money in, in some of the various and sundry grants that we have uh, to address the pandemic in front of us, um, whether or not that's going to be enough and we're gonna have to find some other source of funding uh, has yet to be determined, but uh, that's part of uh, what we're working with uh, the business office on. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair? Yeah, please, Mr. Hemmelberger, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, just to respond to the mayor's uh, comments, the original deadline was March 28th, and then the oh. commissioner had announced that he would extend it to April 16th. Oh. I think okay. that every district that has signed up to do this is planning to continue it uh, through the end of the school year. Um, and I think that the, if I read the, I know this is not always a, a, a fair way to do it, but if I read the political tea leaves, I believe that there will be some more uh, funding um, available. And certainly we know that today they signed the the American Rescue Plan and, and buried in, I think the 500th page, is 130 billion for schools. So I think that, and the commissioner makes a reference to that in his guidance yesterday. So uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that this will be addressed as we continue uh, over the next several weeks. That's helpful, thank you. Um, other questions or comments around the presentation? I have a comment. Please, Secretary Johnson Musa, go ahead. I uh, just want to thank you, Dr. Hool and Mr. Himmelberger for your, your work on all of this. It's really great. And uh, just taking this kind of directive um, from the state and figuring out how to operationalize it and using the incident command structure, et cetera, just seems really great. And I feel like we're in, in very good hands. Um, I just want to, I guess, voice that while we may be very um, energetic in our implementation of this plan that came down from the state and making it work as well as possible from our students for our students it's not the same as necessarily all of us especially me agreeing that the state really should have just directed the student the schools to go um, completely in person on this uh, timeline and um, I I've, I've seen that you know the part of it is that um, some of the chapter 70 funding, I believe, can be withheld from school districts if they don't implement or implement on the right timeline. And, and that really disproportionately affects um, districts with less funding because they have, you know, they have higher need and they have less resources to address the concerns. I'm glad for the, um, the Rescue Act coming through and the, and the funds and so on, but I, I just, um, I want to just express that while we may be, you know, as a committee voting on things to help the implementation of this process go well, that does not necessarily represent our support for the policy itself. Hmm. Thank you, Secretary Johnson Musad. Other questions or discussion from the school committee members? Member Hollins, well, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to thank. Um, Judy, for the work she did, particularly the parent survey with um, graphic review, it, uh, uh, I can't remember when we've seen something like that. It, I just really appreciate that. If I'm correct that you had eight or 900 responses, that's a huge response. Mm -hmm. And what was particularly interesting to me is um, two things. One, 
looking at transportation, which we continue to have as a very high expense with no reimbursement because we're not re regional. And if we're seeing now that uh, the actual use of transportation, we may be able to really uh, rethink how much we're spending on transportation. And um, I also um, think it's really important that we figure out, which I'm sure you're doing, I don't have any question about that, how are we going to continue to have a, a really quality virtual program? Because 25% of our parents are going to want to continue that. And I think we've known that from the beginning, that no matter when everybody went back to school, there were going to be some people more cautious, not wanting to continue that for different reasons, and that we'd always have to figure out how we continue with the virtual program. So I just want to congratulate you on this good work. And it leaves a lot of thinking about uh, moving forward, not only in person, but also transportation and the virtual program. It's a lot of food for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Member Hollins. Any other discussion or questions? I would echo uh, the um, comments about it really being a, a great presentation, very thorough, very easy to digest. Thank you. Um, there are, are two comments I want to make. Um, I've seen on the social media uh, families, parents being concerned that we're not going to apply for waivers for their individual students to be to continue remotely. And I want to just clear that up and make sure I'm understanding correctly. The waiver process is for the district as a whole for certain pieces of this and that no student will be um, denied the opportunity to continue remotely this year. Uh, I'm That's, reading that correctly? That is correct. Okay. The waiver process okay. is for the district to make any uh, adjustments to the reentry plan um, that has been put forth by the commissioner. Um, but parents have the right to choose to stay remote. There is no waiver process. That's just, they just need to let us know that that's what they're going to do. That said, the commissioner has also said that if a parent starts remote and they decide a little later they would like to come back to in-person, um, parents just will need to realize that it might not be something we can flip a switch in 24 hours on, that it is going to take us some lead time to make sure that we have uh, you know, appropriate transportation and space in a classroom and all of the things that need to happen. And so um, he has said four to six weeks. We're looking at some timeline that could be shorter than that. We don't think we'd need that long. We have yet to figure that out. But certainly once we have a sense of what that timeline would be, should a parent change their mind to, um, to go uh, remote that, um, you know, uh, go from remote to in person, excuse me. Um, that that would be a, a case of um, something that they could do. Um, so Thank with you. The regard, regard to the waiver process, um, the elementary waivers must be submitted by Monday, March 22nd at 5 p.m. And um, the requirements, this is all stuff that came out, um, yes, <laughs> came out this morning, so I'm going to cheat and read some things that just came across my desk. Um, they want a description of the specific requested waiver, and within that waiver, they want to know what the physical distancing standard is that's being used. Um, there is some thought on the part of the department that based on what they know of, or what they have found through research on the three feet of distance, that if people are not, again, willing to look at that three feet edge to edge of a desk, um, that that could be problematic. Um, they want to know what the results are of an updated family survey um, regarding the number of students who would be turning, returning in person versus learning remotely. So again, we'll have to push out a second um, survey fairly quickly. And then what is the timeline in which all students would have access to in-person full-time instruction this school year? So any sort of waiver that's requested um, they're really going to push for what's the timeline to get everybody back in the classroom. So, um, okay, that's helpful. 
yeah, a waiver is not going to give you for the rest of the year some sort of hybrid thing. And I know. And so we want we want to do a motion related to that for our uh, fifth grade students. Yes. Um, you know, some people have talked about the the um, you know hybrid and then going full on remote. And to be honest, there are no um, logistical plans in place for either model. So for us to have to come up with a set of logistics for hybrid and then turn around in a couple of weeks and have another set of logistics for full on in person does not make sense in terms of resources. Doesn't make sense, I don't think, for families either that you plan for something in the short term that's, you know, I come two days a week and then I'm home three days and then, you know, two or three weeks later, oops, I'm in five days a week. Um, we just feel like if we're going to do this, we should probably just make the one plan and, and do what the one plan um, asks. So what I've been asking for from the committee is a motion to, um, because um, the commissioner has said the school committee should vote on this, um, would be a motion to um, authorize the uh, interim superintendent to apply for a waiver to uh, move the fifth grade into the middle school opening. We have uh, until April 8th. We have until April 12th to make a decision about um, secondary students and whether or not, you know, eighth grade falls into, um, you know, the middle school opening or if, you know, and the commissioner is all in favor of if somebody wants to go back earlier than they say. So do we have eight through 12 come in on April 28th? What do we do? And again, those are questions that we're still trying to get to the answer of. So I think if we can do this first one, then that would give me the opportunity to apply for the first waiver um, by the deadline. And that would be for the fifth grade to be held off until the middle school opening date. Thank you. Okay. So I am looking at this time for a motion to authorize the interim superintendent to request a waiver from DESE to delay implementation of full-time in-person learning for grade five until the middle school implementation timeline begins. So, so moved. Second. Yeah, everybody, everybody. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, thank you. Any, any further discussion on this? I know I have one question. Are there, but I'll, I can go last. This is member Karen. Please, member Karen, go ahead. Um, I, I'm just asking for clarification. Uh, does it just make everything a little bit more smooth if we wait on the fifth grade? That's all. I know it's only a couple of weeks, and I was glad to see he came out with another date for our, you know, trajectory. But does it just make everything a little easier to wait on the fifth grade because they're in separate buildings? Or I guess what is the reasoning for wanting to wait? Just so I'm clear on it. That's all. Dr. Huell, do you have an uh, answer to that? Because I'm not clear on that either. She may have stepped away for a second. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know, um, not to put you on the spot, Mr. Himmelberger, uh, Alan, but do you happen to know the answer to that? I do not. Okay. So we'll, I, have a guess. We'll, I have a guess, but I don't want to guess on camera. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so when, when Dr. Huell comes back, we can ask yeah. her. Um, and I, my question, and maybe someone on school committee who's smarter than me can answer this is, um, do we, did I miss something big that we don't need to apply for a waiver for sixth grade? Is sixth grade in the state's definition considered middle school? That's what, the way I, what was that? This is member Karen. The way I understood it is sixth through eighth is considered middle school. Yeah. K through okay. elementary, nine through 12 is high school. So, okay. Okay. I have Other a question. questions. Yeah. It, I was a little confused by that because I have uh, someone that I know in a center who I'm pretty sure was thinking he was going to the high school. So uh, if if I could have some clarification on that. Um, is our high school A through 12? Or, uh, so middle school is only five, six, seven, or six and seven. Um, I, 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 eighth, eighth grade's at the high school. Eighth yeah, I can, high school. So I they can help with that one. 
they would be following that um, high school schedule, which is the TVA, unless we decide in this vote that it's eight through 12. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Comments? Yeah. Um, let's let's get our answer to our question and then member Holland's on, have you make a comment. So uh, Dr. Hull, while you were gone, there was a question about um, why are we asking for a waiver to wait for grade five? Grade five? Um, I think it's just a case of um, scheduling in terms of the middle school and transportation. Um, you know, it'd be a separate run to the middle school for just the one grade level. Um, and uh, it just seems to make better sense that since they are part of the middle school, that they come back when the middle school comes back. I apologize, I ran out of battery power and before I could plug in, whoop. <laughs> No worries. Thank you for this that. Is not my tech, this is not my tech night. <laughs> <laughs> we all have those. Oh, Member Hollins, go ahead. I was going to say, I could explain the grade eight because I moved grade eight to the high school. According to statute, high school is the grades that follow grade eight. So when we moved grade up, we called it an academy. We separated it out with a separate wing and a separate principal, which is how you got a third principal of the high school. And according to our policy and state guidelines, eighth grades, technically middle school, there are other districts that have eighth grade in their high school building, but it doesn't make them a high school grade. I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for that. Just to, yeah, just to uh, piggyback on that, unfortunately, because of um, the numbers of students and staff reductions and whatever else, the eighth grade is not really a standalone anymore. They do share faculty with the high school. So again, it's a, it's an issue of scheduling and we again have not figured that piece of it out. So I would not be asking for any sort of waiver at the moment anyway, for eighth grade. Um, this is just the elementary fifth grade um, waiver. Thank you for that clarification. Um, further discussion, questions? I guess the only thing I would add I have, uh, I, I just have to acknowledge there's a little bit of concern for me because um, there are, a, 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 you know, a quarter of our students um, really at all levels kind of choosing to stay remote. Um, and then at another about quarter who are unsure at this point what they're going to do in many of those uh, levels. Um, that it, it, it's, it, I, I'm not sure how, I, I hope we can manage that really well. That's, that's all we, uh, we know through this pandemic process that we can't make everyone happy. We know as a school committee in general, it's very hard to please everyone all of the time, if not impossible. Um, so I just really look for, um, all of us to kind of do our best work to make sure that, um, we're addressing concerns and questions. Um, and I do think our uh, uh, listening sessions or um, fo whatever we're calling them will help a great deal. I think that I think that will improve um, some of the outcomes with the survey. Because um, I, I do have a pit in my stomach when I look at that. That's a lot of people who are saying, no, I want to stay remote or no, I'm not really sure yet. Or I want hybrid, which isn't an option. Um, so we just kind of need to be on top of that stuff. Right. And, and some that's, of the comments, that's Yeah, some of the comments that came through was that people were not feeling comfortable making a decision without more details. And, and we certainly understand that, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not more details will drive the numbers down or up remains to be seen. And you are absolutely right. This is like the worst snow day call of the century. <laughs> Having made yes, a fair number of snow day calls in my day, uh, as Alan has, and I'm sure as Susan uh, Holland says, uh, everybody hates snow days, and this is like snow days on steroids, pretty much. Yeah. So um, yeah. it, is, it is one of those things where we understand we're just not going to. Yeah. As, as we'd like to, but again, we, we're doing our best under the circumstances. and. The commissioner said openly that we can blame him, so I am blaming the commissioner. <laughs> so, yeah, the commissioner uh, couldn't find Greenfield on a map. He doesn't give me much, much. Uh, I don't have much faith in him. Here, here, <laughs> here, here. <laughs> so, in the realm also of policies that I'm asking you to fast track through. 
um, is um, the policy on face coverings. And this was a policy. Yeah, oh, we have to vote. Let's, we'll vote on this one first, and then we'll do the face covering yeah, one. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so, no, it's okay. It's late, and that, yeah, that <laughs> happens. So uh, any further discussion on this? Secretary Johnson Musad will do a roll call vote, please. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, thank you. So there is another motion needed. Um, there is a policy, EBCFA. <laughs> Sounds like the worst radio call letters ever. Uh, on face coverings. And I don't know that we got that in the materials, but here it is. Someone is sharing it. Thank you. Um, and we need a motion to waive the first and second reading and approve the policy as presented. Uh, Dr. Hool, do you want to walk us through it a little bit? Sure. And then we'll do the motion. Um, this is a policy that actually MASC came up with back in August when we were going back to, um, uh, you know, some sort of uh, in-person learning. Um, so I pretty much, this is it as it was written. The only thing I added to it was um, this, uh, phrase at the end of the last sentence that um, prior to uh, the commissioner's new guidance, um, children in grades one and younger um, could be exempted from this face mask policy. Um, the commissioner's guidance has said effective immediately, everybody's going to wear a face mask, no matter how old you are. So um, mm -hmm. it's basically defining what a face covering is um, and defining excuse from um, now, the requirement per CDC guidelines, um, you know, people who have medical behavior, all the challenges making it unsafe to wear a face mask, um, a written note from a physician is required for an extent exemption and the parents can't just um, excuse their child from the face mask requirement by signing a waiver um, because of personal preference. Um, so, Obviously, children will be afforded uh, mask breaks during um, the course of the day. Um, you know, a little trip outside and a couple of other districts I was in before I was here in Greenfield. Uh, Lee in particular, you know, kids went outside, had their mask break, came back in and, you know, went back to work. Um, while eating and drinking, obviously, not have to get, do that physical education uh, using, um, you know, appropriate distancing, et cetera, and while outside. Um, so, you know, the um, business about approving things by the um, building principal and then um, in consultation with the school nurse or the local board of health, um, that face shields could be an alternative to masks if needed to. Um, the policy also states that a student's mask or face covering is to be provided by the student's uh, family. Staff members would be responsible for their own. Um, the district will supply some disposable face coverings and uh, we are doing a um, inventory of uh, face masks uh, at the different schools, making sure that we have enough supply and getting more ordered um, to make sure that um, that happens. And then some consequences because those same people that I talked about who don't make the best decisions might <laughs> not make a good decision about wearing face masks in school. And so that gives, this gives the principal some authority um, to be able to deal with that if it's a disciplinary issue versus uh, some sort of medical or behavioral exemption. Um, and this uh, legal references are and other references from uh, the Commonwealth, the Centers of Disease Control, uh, uh, control and then um, as you can see, the source is uh, MASC in August and then amended by the DESE guidance of yesterday. So we're right on top of things. We're, we're in the moment. This is impressive. Okay. So, um, did we, we didn't make the motion yet. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So I am looking for a motion to waive the first and second readings of the EBCFA face covering policy and approve the policy as presented. So move. So move. 
I'll second. I think that was Member Karen and I'm Johnson. Member Musa. Ekstrom and, and, and Secretary oh, Johnson Musa. Okay. Yep. Um, and any further discussion or questions? Mayor. Please go ahead, Mayor Rita Garner. I'm not trying to throw a wrinkle in this because I think it's important, but unless there was an updated agenda, this doesn't appear on the agenda. Um, it is part of the update on in-person instruction. Ah, okay. That's, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that clarification for anyone who might have been wondering, but that's exactly yeah. what this is. It's about the in-person instruction and moving forward with that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Hollins? Go ahead, Member Hollins. Um, way down at the bottom of this policy, I, there's something about, there's a sentence that says, First, it says what will happen if students don't bring in the, the mask. They, it says, uh, second page, if students violate it, the principal is going to consult with the parent and the student may be removed from school. And then uh, if visitors are in violation, they won't be allowed to come into school. And then there's a sentence that says, violations of this policy by staff will be handled the same way as other violations of school committee policy. I'm not aware we have any guidelines. I mean, we have lots of policies. I'm not so sure we're following. And I, I don't know that there is a, there's any definition to the same manner as violations of other school committee policy. That's the only sentence. I think if a staff member violates this, it seems to me that the issue would be handled by the superintendent, but I don't know that we have any school committee guideline for what we do if somebody violates one of our policies. So that sentence is a problem for me, but nothing else. Thank you, Reverend Hall. Uh, Dr. Hull, go ahead. Um, just, I don't think it's referring to um, the fact that uh, there would be a policy on violating policies, but basically if, uh, staff members in violation of one of your policies, um, that uh, begins a progressive discipline process, whether it's an oral warning or a letter of reprimand or some other disciplinary action, the same as if they violated the sexual harassment policy or they violated some other, you know, your empowered digital use policy, um, that there would be, you know, certainly due process and progressive discipline as um, required. It's, it's just that it looks like we do have some kind of intervention policy and what you're explaining makes perfect sense, but that's a superintendent member. It sounds like it's some route. I'm just trying to point out that we don't really as a school committee have, have something specific for that sentence is a problem for me, but not a superintendent intervening for corrective discipline. That's not a problem. Okay, but it doesn't anyway, sound like it's a deal comment. breaker. Okay, thank you. It doesn't sound like it's a deal breaker, right? We can still move forward with this. Um, any further comments or questions? Mayor Wiedegartner. Go ahead. ahead. For the people who have to follow this, what's the, anyway. Can I speak now? Please, go ahead. Yeah. I, 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 it's not, again, it's not a deal breaker. It's just a cautionary statement, I think. Uh, the sentence, a student's mask or face covering is to be provided by the student's family is, is innocent enough as it is, and it is certainly um, justified. But we learned early on in the pandemic that masks, and they were scarce then, uh, less so now, because they seem to be utterly ubiquitous, <laughs> uh, are expensive. And we may have a certain level of population that really can't do that on a daily basis. They can't buy at $40 a box um, masks for their children, especially if they have more than one, ch children, one child in the family. So I don't know what's to be done about that. And I, I do think we covered a little bit about however the district will supply disposable face coverings for individuals who arrive at a building, et cetera. Yeah. And that's the city exactly. Green, yeah. That, and the, that, that and I appreciate that. And I know you've ordered a, a lot of masks, but then we have a lot of people to give them to, staff and so forth. 
the city of Greenfield certainly has a supply. I'm not saying that we would put forth all of them, but you know, we, we can be appealed to um, if necessary. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> the chief strain will probably kill me, but uh. <laughs> no, no, and and I think that was the this that actually those two sentences came out of the initial guidance that came out of the DESI when yeah, well, no surprise then started um, yeah. was that you know that parents you know in as much as they were able to um, should be supplying masks, but in sure. those cases where you know. Uh, low income or a child just forgets it. I have a stash of disposables in my car because there are times when I run out the door in the morning and I go, oops. And so I pull it out of my center console because I just don't always remember. So if I don't remember, well, I'm old, but you know, if I don't remember, um, somebody who's trying to get three or four kids out the door may not remember on a given day. So uh, certainly will provision for those um, instances. Okay. Well, and I do know too, just a, a comment related to that, that um, we have community members <clears throat> who are often looking for ways to help, including yeah. it's not unusual for, you know, a, a family, a parent to supply paper towels or, um, you know, disinfecting wipes and things like that for a classroom. And we can just kind of add this to the list. And there are plenty of folks out there in our our very um, generous community who would be willing to help with that, I am certain. Mm -hmm. But thank you for bringing it up. Any further comment or question before we vote on this? Okay, hearing none, let's uh, do a roll call vote, please, Member Johnson Musad. Member Karen? Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. yes. Member Hollins? No, for the reason I mentioned. Secretary Johnson, we thought I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Mayor Wiedegaard? Yes. Yes. Motion carries with six yeas and one nay. Thank, Thank you. you. Can you can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I lost my internet connection on my laptop, so I'm not sure why. Um, hopefully this will not get, get this connection will not get lost. I am thinking we're done with the in-person instruction. Yay. Okay. Moving on to item 11, DESI program review on April 5. Um, Dr. Hool, take it away. Sure. Why not have the state come in to do a review on the day we open the doors? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say. Uh, no, um, but seriously, our colleague, uh, Dr. Ekstrom, who's in another school committee meeting and couldn't be here since her apologies, has been working with the special education department. And there will be some things that will need to be done prior to that visit. So during one of those lovely extra meetings we'll probably have, um, there is a special education handbook that needs a couple of updates that will need your approval, et cetera, so we can get these things on the website um, uh, and, mm -hmm. and get some things moving forward in advance of that uh, review. So um, just wanted to let you know that the state is coming. They are here and they're here to help is what they tell me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, and we'll... You know, uh, you know and, and the thing about reviews like this when you're in my position is like, you know, okay, thank you very much. Um, this predates me, but we'll fix it. So that's pretty yeah. much how you can respond to these kinds of things. So I know uh, Chair uh, Proietti just went through an accreditation review at her place of work. So, you, they, you know, she can feel my pain. <laughs> and I do. It's still very real. It just ended this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so just... Um, uh, Yes. You're aware of that um, um, uh, member uh, Johnson Massad will probably need to have a uh, policy subcommittee sooner rather than later to take a look at some of these things and then um, get something in front of the okay. school committee. Okay. And do we, Madam Chair, can go, I ask please a go ahead? Yeah, question. I guess, can you say more about what the review is and is there any possibility of requesting a delay? I mean, does that ever, or do you, do we need it or not? I, I guess that's 
I'm just wondering because you did note the timing is not exactly right. ideal. Um, I could certainly reach out to Associate Commissioner uh, Russell Johnston. I know Russell um, and just see if perchance they might consider that considering it, it would be the first day of us uh, welcoming children back into the district that maybe another day might be in order. Um, uh, I don't mind making that phone call. Um, the commissioner did say that, you know, people were talking about reviews that were upcoming and he blamed the federal government who forces these reviews to happen. So everybody's pointing fingers at everybody else around this, but uh, certainly I'd be happy to make that call to uh, Russell and see if maybe we can hold it off for a little bit. Is that can you say more about what it is, what it is in general? I'm not familiar, I guess. Um, the um, federal statutes that uh, govern special education, English language learners, and Title I uh, require that um, districts uh, get a review. I don't even remember what they call the reviews anymore. They used to call them CPRs, which were coordinated program reviews. They have some new name that I can't even tell you at this moment. I don't know, Alan, if you remember it or not. Um, One of the new names is tiered focused monitoring. <laughs> Uh, it means the same thing, and as Dr. Hull said, it's going through a lot of regulations, making sure you have all of the um, issues addressed and in place, and if not, there's a finding, and you have a certain amount of time to address it. Um, mm. No penalties, usually. Mm. So, Yeah, no withholding of uh, funds. They just take what you need to do and get it done. My last one, yeah. <laughs> so I will and make a note. How to call Russell uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Do you need Do you need a vote from us on that, or are you okay with just proceeding? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Just, uh, Thank you. I'll just. Any other further? Cut us a break. <laughs> I appreciate that. I, I appreciate. I think that. I think that's a wise call to make to at least try for all of our sake, but particularly for your sanity, Doctor Hull. <laughs> yeah. I do have to say that the vote about. Um, you know, the redrawing or the discussion around redrawing dropped my blood pressure a significant amount. So thank you. If we could do that for you. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll take that one. We're happy to do that. Yeah. Don't get used to it. <laughs> uh, further questions or comments on this topic? All right. So that, I think, brings us to the end of the public section of the agenda. We do need to do an executive session. Uh, we will not be returning for a public vote. Am I correct on that? I don't think there's anything we need to return here for a public vote. So we will end the public portion of the meeting. The executive session is being called uh, for MGL C30A subsection 21 exemptions two and three. Two is to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. And number three is to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares and I do declare. Um, can I get a motion to... Uh, open the executive session. Bye, yes. Alan. Nice to see you. So moved. Bye, Alan. Uh, that was Good. a motion from uh, Mayor Riedegarder and a second. Second, Johnson Musad. Okay, can we just do a roll call vote on that, please? Yep. Uh, Member Karen. Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom. Yes. Member Hollins. Yes. Secretary Johnson Musad. I'm a yes. Chair Proietti. Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedergardner? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. And now uh, a motion to close the public session, please. So moved. Johnson Musab? And a second. second. Second by Member Wall. And a, a roll call vote, please. Member Karen? Yes. Vice Chair Ekstrom? Yes. Member Hollins? Yes. Secretary Johnson Musad, I'm a yes. Chair Proietti? Yes. Member Wall? Yes. Mayor Wiedegardner? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, so we are uh, adjourned in the public session at 8.49 p.m.
I'll give you all a nice 11 minutes at nine o'clock. We will start our executive session. Please don't be late.